I could bring this meeting to order, please, so that we can make an effort to stay a little bit on time today. That would be good. And we do have some new folks that have joined us and a couple folks that we already know are going to be a little bit late. But let's start over here with Councillor Kelly and just go around the room and introduce yourself. And Great. My name is Thomas Kelly. I'm a newly uh, appointed uh, commissioner for the town of Bel Air and very excited to be here. So thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Vice Mayor Andrew Knapp from the city of Oldsmar. I've been serving for the last four years and uh, recently appointed to take the place of Jared Buckman. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Vice Mayor Chris Burke, City of Seminole, representing the inland communities. Good morning, Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council, representing PSTA. Good morning, Eric Girard, Vice Mayor, City of Largo. Good morning, and all the, everybody, everybody moving around their seats, so. <laughs> you are over there, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commissioner. Dave Albritton, uh, Clearwater City Council and Treasurer of Ford Pinellas. Good morning, Whit Blanton. I'm the Executive Director of Ford Pinellas. Brian. Good morning, Brian Scott, Pinellas County Commission, District 2. Good morning and happy Valentine's Day. Patty Reed, the Vice Mayor of Pinellas Park. I'm uh, Richie Floyd, Council Member in the City of St. Petersburg. And I think I'm last but not least, uh, good morning all, Vice Mayor of Tarpon Springs or North Pinellas. Well, welcome we are North Pinellas. <laughs> welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here today. Um, do we want to start now with the invocation and the pledge? We're not planning to do that for a little while. We'll do that at our regular meeting. Oh, we're going to do that at our regular meeting. Yep. Okay, so with... Do you want to? I'll get us started. All right. Okay, let's go. Well, thank you all very much for carving out some time for us today. We know we're keeping you for the bulk of uh, the, the day today, and that's unusual. Um, but we've got some uh, substantive items to discuss with you. And uh, most every year, we have at least one workshop a year. And usually, it's at the end of the year as we start thinking about um, the coming year. But sometimes, we've done it in the beginning of the year. And so this is. Um, uh, just an opportunity to us to take a little deeper dive into three topics that are going to be important as we move into uh, the new year and into 2025. And I'll start with the first one, but I, I just want to give you a, a, a little bit of context about all three. We are facing some pretty big changes here at Ford Pinellas, and I want to first welcome the new faces to our table because We've invited a bigger group here because we are expanding our board. This board took action earlier in the year to reapportion uh, in, in response to the uh, 2020 census and uh, reflect a more inclusive uh, board as we think about a regional metropolitan planning organization. And so we've invited representatives from those cities uh, that are soon to become members of the board uh, and not sure exactly who will be appointed. We just asked to send somebody, and so um, we're happy to have that uh, perspective here today. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is how we manage the new re reapportioned board with 19 members, and do we change some things up? Do we keep things status quo, or is there a, a different way that you all would like to see us operate uh, as we grow the size of the board? Related to that uh, is the discussion that we're going to be having starting on Friday with the TMA leadership group about how a regional MPO might function as we consider the merger with Pasco and Hillsboro and potentially as large of a 25 member board with that or as small as five members. And we want to take you through a little bit of an exercise that Hillsborough County has already gone through um, so that we have the same kind of guidance to our representatives at the TMA leadership group about how big should that regional board be, how should we treat our operating agencies like the port and airport and expressway authority and uh, even our transit agencies, how should they be part of that composition? Uh, and we'd like to get your thoughts on that. That conversation will continue throughout the year, so we're not going to be making any decisions on Friday, uh, but it, it's going to take several meetings to get through all that. 
Um, the next thing we'll talk about is our 2050 Advantage Pinellas Long Range Plan. And I just want to say that, um, you know, we look at our advantages that we have here in Pinellas County and we look to strengthen those advantages. And there's some areas where we may not be uh, particularly strong or have an, a, an advantage today, but how can it be something that's an advantage in the future? And I've long said that our diversity of 25 local governments from Tarpon to Gulfport is one of our strengths and one of our advantages that we have. And I think that's something that we need to embrace. Um, I'll make a little joke that I was thinking about this morning. 20 years ago uh, or more, I was working on a long range plan, I think in Sarasota Manatee, and I was having a, a good natured argument with a traffic engineer that I worked with from my hometown of Kings Mount, North Carolina. And we were debating what we should consider in this long range plan. And he was getting a little frustrated with me because I was talking about health and obesity and uh, uh, environmental impacts and things like that. And he said, well, pretty soon you're gonna include the cost of the Gulf War in everything that we do here. And that was, you know, we, we had a good natured joke about that and we weren't including the cost of the Gulf War in, in our analysis, but it speaks to the interrelatedness of everything we do when we talk about land use and transportation. Our economy, our housing costs, our property insurance, um, our car insurance, all of it is related to how we manage our transportation network and how we think about growth and development in our county. So just kind of be thinking about those threads that come together when we think about Advantage Pinellas and looking out 25 years into the future. Some of you may have participated in the Tampa Bay Partnership um, Regional Competitiveness Summary Report. They had an event uh, this past week and um, We've, they've done it like seven years in a row where they compare the Tampa Bay region with peer regions around the country, some aspirational in nature and some more al along our level, uh, including places in Florida. And we're doing some really well in some areas, but there's some other areas in infrastructure, for example, safety, where we're not doing as well, and we've actually declined over those years. So uh, I'll make this available to everybody, but I encourage you to take a look at this regional competitiveness report because we don't do transportation for transportation's sake. We do it for outcomes, whether they're economic or social or health or um, the environment. The last item we're gonna talk about after we take a break uh, is to think about how we are budgeting for our future uh, workload and, and our projects that we're taking on. That'll be a working lunch session, so we'll have lunch provided. Um, the first two items, we're gonna want a lot of feedback and input from you. This last one is really maybe more of an informational item while you eat, um, but we certainly want to hear feedback and guidance on you as we submit our budget, uh, which is due in a matter of uh, a few days, uh, and as we adopt our MPO budget, which is due in about a month or two. Uh, you'll be having a more detailed presentation on that at your March meeting. Uh, and then we'll leave some time for wrap up and then we'll re-adjourn at one o'clock for our regular meeting. Any questions about what we're about to do today? We'll keep it really informal. Uh, we're not taking any votes, not taking any actions today. What you're doing is giving our staff needed guidance uh, with your discussion today. Uh, and let's welcome Councillor Mohammed. Thank you for being here. Um, any questions with regard to what's Summary, executive summary of where we're going and how we might get there. No questions? Not yet. Okay. Heat up the coffee, Tony. <laughs> Obviously, everybody's... <laughs> it's not... 10 o'clock. We're not used to meeting at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, without Council Commissioner Eggers, you have no comments? Go ahead and get started on the first item then, if you're Let's ready. Let's go. All right. Can we call up the PowerPoint presentation and we'll talk about the apportionment plan. And I'll just, uh, I'll just walk us through this one. Um, Tina, should I go up there and advance the slides? All right, I'm gonna do that. Okay, so the first thing is how we start planning for the, our, our, our board being reapportioned. And I think this conversation will lead into um, the discussion about the regional MPO. 
So we follow state law uh, in how we establish our voting structure, and there's some broad guidance that you need to keep in mind, and that is we can have a board of anywhere from as few as five people to as many as 25 people. They have to represent the uh, local elected officials and public agencies that operate transportation systems, and we have some flexibility in how that happens. Uh, years ago, the Florida Department of Transportation used to be a voting member of this board. Uh, now, statewide, they are a non-voting advisor, and uh, uh, we have um, you know, that relationship with them. In Hillsborough County, uh, they have some of their transportation operators who are voting members of the board, and they, don't, um, uh, they are not elected officials. Um, these seats must be apportioned by population. We went through that exercise for the most part of 2023. Um, and had many different votes and attempts to make that all work, and we finally settled <coughs> on a larger board. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners in state law must have a minimum of 20% of the voting seats. If we do not have a transit agency representing uh, uh, as a voting member of the board, then that percentage rises to 25%. Um, and we do have rotating seats, and that's been permitted, and that, I think that's been, worked pretty well. The new structure changes that a little bit to where the terms of those rotating seats are one year longer and there are fewer um, cities that are part of that rotation. So we're looking at the geographic area and voting membership of the MPO uh, and we have to have an MPO if we have 50,000 uh, population or more. We don't have to have an ind individual MPO in each county. Uh, that's something that's unique to our area and the South Florida region. Um, this has to be reviewed after every census, and uh, the apportionment plans must be approved by the majority of the Ford Pinellas Board and approved by the governor. We are still waiting on that uh, approval from the governor, but we are beginning the process of developing the amended interlocal agreement, updated interlocal agreement, to send that around to everybody and get approval contingent on the governor's approval, ultimately. So today, we have 13 board members, uh, and you can see the apportionment there, three for the Board of County Commissioners, two for the City of St. Pete, and so on there. Uh, we have six inland communities currently, so uh, one of the things we wanted to do was um, provide a little more uh, opportunity for people to grow and uh, become more knowledgeable while they're on the board, because it feels like at the end of two years, that's when they start getting their expertise, and then it rotates to a different city. The new board voting structure I'll linger on just a little bit um, so you can remind yourselves. Uh, we will grow to 19 seats, four Board of County Commissioners, four City of St. Pete members, an additional City of Clearwater, uh, and then we've got uh, an additional seat for Tarpon Springs, and then we've uh, created a seat just for Oldsmar and Safety Harbor, very geographically aligned, uh, and then we've divided the six inland communities into two groups of three, as you see here. And the percentage of the population and the percentage of vote was about as close as we came with any of the other iterations. Thanks, Commissioner Eggers, for this solution that, that everybody seemed to support. So the timeline is that um, this happened back in August, and we very quickly got this all transmitted to the state. Um, I believe they're about to submit everything to the governor's office, or maybe they already have, but we don't know a timetable for that, I imagine it'll be after the legislative session. Uh, we are drafting the interlocal agreement uh, and we'll be sending that around. Once the, uh, the governor signs, then we'll be fully executed and ready to go. So we wanna uh, be able to move right into this new board as, as expeditiously as possible. Uh, we have 60 days uh, for the local governments to appoint their members. So once the interlocal is executed and the governor has signed, uh, we will be in touch with all the local governments and you'll have to formally then appoint uh, the representatives. Uh, those of you who are already appointed and the seats aren't changing, that's probably not gonna be an issue. It'll be the new cities of, of Tarpon Springs and Gulfport where we'll need to get that action. Um, and then we'll begin meeting as this new board. So today, I'd just like to get your feedback and we'll be taking notes and this is an open discussion uh, but how can I serve you as your executive director? Uh, that's one question with a new 19-member board. I currently meet with most of you prior to every board meeting, and we spend anywhere from half an hour to an hour uh, talking through what's on the agenda. But what I really like about these meetings is we talk about a lot of things that aren't on the agenda, that might be coming down the pike in six months, might be something to think about that's not necessarily on an agenda in the near term. 
and I value those discussions, and I hope you do too, I would like to continue to do that. We can certainly do it by phone. We can do it by uh, whatever means of communication. I don't have to physically go to everybody uh, before the board meeting, but that's been, uh, I think, a very successful practice over the last several years. The second part of this question is, what should we do as a staff to make these meetings as productive, productive and as efficient as possible with this larger board? And I've just given a few suggestions here that we've talked about internally, is we could move to a more of a uh, workshop and board meeting structure like many of the cities and the county commission do, where periodically you have work, work sessions or workshops that um, uh, are prior to the actual board meeting, and that's where more of the discussion happens, and then the meetings become a little bit more of a formality. The other component was we could establish some committees. We had, I think, a very successful run as a legislative and policy committee, where we focused primarily in the run-up and during the legislative session here in the state, focused on our legislative priorities and various elements of uh, communication to our legislative delegation. Uh, we could reconstitute that, or we could create a different sort of board structure. Right now, the standing committee for the board is an executive committee that is primarily charged with my evaluation, uh, and occasionally we convene the executive committee to think about bigger picture, longer range items uh, as we wrap up the year. So I think before we go to the regional MPO, we'll stop here and pause for a minute and just see if there's any feedback on how do you like to manage this larger 19 member board? Anybody want to start? Commissioner Driscoll. Good evening. Thank you, and thank you for that overview. Um, I, I just want to throw out some of my own thoughts on these, these various items, and thank you for letting us know about like what the next steps are and what the timing is. Are you thinking that this will happen within the next few months? My best guess would be July, June, July timeframe. Okay. Okay. And then after that, we'll have 60 days at that point. I'm hoping we can actually seat the board by July. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that, you know, that'll depend on the timing. It's unpredictable of mm -hmm. when the governor will approve. All right. Um, when that happens, St. Petersburg, because of our um, percentage of the of the population, will be increasing the St. Petersburg seats from two to four. I currently have, um, you know, I'm from St. Petersburg, but I officially hold the PSTA seat, and I just want everyone to know I see. Um, the challenges, because having five out of eight of our city council members on this board could, could present a challenge. And also, um, it really weights St. Petersburg even more, because even though I'm representing PSTA, I have uh, knowledge to share about St. Petersburg. So um, I wanted everyone to know that when this happens, I've already spoken with PS, PSTA, um, CEO Brad Miller, and then also with the St. Petersburg administration, that when this expands, I am going to request to be moved over to one of the new St. Pete seats so that the PSTA seat can then be held uh, by someone who is on the board of PSTA and on the executive committee, but um, perhaps from a different part of our county. So I, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that, just in case anyone's thinking, gosh, St. Pete's going to have five out of the 19, and that's a lot. So I um, wanted to share that. As far as the um, interactions uh, with uh, WIT and the one-on-one the -on -one time, I was thinking that just to make things as efficient as possible, um, it, it would be better if we can try to do things by a phone call or do it virtually just so that he can get through everyone because he'll be going to 19 people. Um, and uh, an, another option could be that the one-on-one -on -one meetings are by request from either side 
So um, for me, on, on St. Petersburg City Council, I don't have a one-on-one -on -one with the administration before every single meeting. But if there's an item on the agenda that I want to talk about, I'll reach out to the administration and have that meeting. Or if there's something that they feel that they need to have a more in-depth one-on-one discussion behind closed doors, then they'll reach out to me. So there could be that approach as well. Um, I would have a comfort level with that because I read the material and if I've got a question, I know how to find wit. So I wanted to throw that idea out there. Um, that just means it's important for everyone to do their homework and make sure we all know um, what's on the agenda before we get to this meeting. And then finally, I think the quarterly workshops would be preferred um, by me over having committees, which would mean more time and more things on this on everyone's schedules. Um, that with quarterly workshops, that or that could be as needed, depending on um, what the topics are, what the burning issues are, and. Um, it could also be used for people to get additional information since we'll have um, even more new people on the board. We, You know what's coming down the pike. And so the workshops actually could be set up around specific topics um, like um, the TEAL study and TOD because uh, we'll be voting on, on things related to that. And rather than educating everyone from square one, including those of us who are already well versed in it, it could be a workshop that's specifically for that. So I think there are ways that the workshops could actually work very well for everyone. Um, all right, and um, if we did committees, I would just wanna know what kind and how many, and I would ask that there be a requirement that every member of the board serve on at least one committee. Okay. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Scott was next. Yeah, I saw him. Okay. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Dis Driscoll actually covered a lot of a lot of my thoughts. Um, the I think our one-on-ones uh, are very valuable. I think uh, doing the virtual Zoom Teams call whatever works is a great format. And I agree that we often just talk about things that are not on the agenda, which I think is probably sometimes more valuable than what is on the agenda. So, um, going forward. You know, what we do now, whether it's a committee structure or, you know, maybe a, a quarterly work session, I see as, as possibly a template or a preamble to what maybe a merged MPO could somewhat look like. So I'm just curious from, from your um, experience, what do, the, uh, what do other MPOs around the state do, whether they're, you know, just individual MPOs or merged MPOs in terms of a committee or a work session structure? That maybe, is there something out there that we would want to emulate? There are some good examples. Uh, one thing that I've seen is the bigger the MPO, the more committees they have and the more formal those processes are. Uh, in Orlando, they have a, a local government, um, a, a smaller local government committee. It's, it's, I think it used to be called the Mayor's Council, but it's been revised and renamed. And that represents the cities that don't have a seat on the board. Um, so they fall below the threshold. And that may be something we look at as the regional MPO uh, gets, gets formed. The thing that you, we'll all need to think about is, and, and this is why we put these topics together, the regional and our local, is that the special act for the Pinellas Planning Council that integrates the MPO in with the land use planning responsibilities in statute references the MPO board as the governing board for the Pinellas Planning Council. So we know whenever we move forward with a regional MPO, we're gonna to have to come back and revisit that statute. And we're still gonna need an advisory body to the Board of County Commissioners as the countywide planning authority to recommend land use case actions to. to. And that body could also represent the smaller local governments in advising the regional MPO. So that's, something we could consider as well. The other point I wanted to add, uh, mention in response to Commissioner or Council Member Driscoll's comment is I don't think we are bound, um, and I'll need to confirm this with staff, to have the PSTA representative be an elected official, because in Hillsborough it's not. Um, and 
That's correct. So we have the option of having staff serve in, in the role that you're currently serving in to avoid that conflict. That's something that the board can determine. I, I don't have a strong preference personally. Sam. Yeah, I just wanted to, to confirm that the terms will still be one year uh, for the, the groups that are rotating. It's going to be three years with the new. Three-year terms. Yeah, okay, so it'll still be, so say, uh, one of our cities, so it'll be nine-year space in between when a city's represented again? Um, let's see. Yes, so for rotating. You're, in, you're in a group of three, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be a nine-year period. Okay. Which is better than the 12. We have. How is that handled when there's a change in, um, in the membership? Would the, not, will the city that's on there say somebody is not reelected or opts not to run again? Will that seat still say, stay with that city? Yes. And they just appoint, okay. So that's it, doesn't, right. it won't just go to the next rotation. That's why we have Mr. Knapp here today. Um, so he's still representing Oldsmar, but we had a change in the representation okay. at the end of December. All right, great, because when we were PPC, I know we worked on doing that rotation, which is great because then you're not, you know, vying against another elected official for the spot. You just follow the rotation, kind of eases the eases the pain of any conflict if you've got a few people that want it. Um, but uh, kind of amen to what Council Councilwoman Driscoll just said in terms of I'm definitely a believer in more meetings is not necessarily a good thing. So I would be uh, very much in favor of um, you know meeting virtually unless there's you know unless someone prefers to do the in person because those are also very helpful. Um, but also, you know, workshops on the day of meetings as opposed to committees or workshops on separate days, I think is, is, is a good thing uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I appreciate your, your input and your willingness to, to offer up another seat for another city. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Knapp. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple points of feedback. I've only had one one-on-one -on -one with the executive director, but I felt like we could have spent another hour or two <laughs> chatting about transportation issues. So I, I think it was really beneficial to have those types of interfaces. And I think it's a great point to say when it's needed, um, you know, it may not always make sense or, or everything's well understood by any of us individual board members <laughs> for the agenda. So by all means, I think we should continue to have those opportunities for interfacing with you. I guess the one thing that I, I would like to maybe pose a question, just because being new, um, as far as the rotating seats go, now that those terms will be going longer in the rotation, how, how can we, and maybe that's a committee thing of how do we make sure that the other member cities for that seat kind of stay involved and apprised of what's going on? Because for a, for a nine year period, somebody's not tuned in then we don't necessarily know what's going on. So that's something I think for those West us sharing seats to take into consideration. Yeah, and I think that's an area where I think we could work maybe a little bit better as staff is to reinforce that uh, communication with the cities that aren't on the rotation. Your predecessor, I think, did a pretty good job going around and speaking to the other local governments. In fact, he got Tarpon Springs to feel like, you know, we need to have a seat here too because he went and, and spoke to them, which I think was good. Uh, not everybody has done that. Um, and we reach out to the local governments, and I've had conversations with, with Bel Air, I've had conversations with Seminole when they weren't on the board, when things come up. Um, but it's not a regular thing. So maybe, maybe having a standing time where we ask you to maybe go to the city of Tarpon Springs and get on the agenda and just give them an update on sure. Ford Pinellas. Yeah, I would be in favor of that. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kelly? Yes, I would just like to speak to the quarterly workshop. I think with the expansion of the participants, I think inclusive and diversity within those workshops would be amazing now because we have all different sizes of cities. And everybody comes, has a different background, their city has a different uh, setup. I think what people could speak to freely in a workshop would be much more beneficial or the entire group and everybody, you know, I might have an idea that St. Pete might not have thought of or how it affects us. And I think it would be a, a much more open arena to speak to within the quarterly workshops. And then secondly, you know, does it, how does that workshop, does it report to the committee? I think those are some things that would need to be discussed and um, firmed up. But I think it's a great thought process, I think, from. Uh, my point of view being part of this is really important to 
all groups of city with, with Impinellas because everybody has an opinion, mm -hmm. as we know. Yeah, absolutely. And we do go to the um, Suncoast League of Cities meetings and brief them. That usually happens about once a year. Hold on, uh, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I think a lot of the comments or thoughts that I have have been said this morning a little bit. I would say for the quarterly meeting idea is a good one. I think there's, whether it's getting, having the conversation about um, legislative issues in the fourth quarter leading up to next year, not having, I, I think get, let's get away from committees. I like the idea of all of us engaging in that discussion okay. instead of three or four that are on that committee. Um, so I think the quarterly meetings are good. Um, I'm not sure about the one-on-ones that we have. I mean, there, certainly we have a lot of new members, and I think if the focus is their first year, every, every new member's first year should maybe be one-on-ones with you every month, um, and then kind of back down to maybe a couple a year. I mean, it just, there's so many things that are going, and frankly, we need you doing other things than just meeting with us. But I think for new members, it's really important that first year, so. Um, it's just, you're just saying that because our meetings are typically 9 a.m. on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and the other thing I would say is, you know, kind of piggybacking with that is that um, maybe you could put together a, a, a not, not a white paper, but a one page thing that kind of summarizes the key points of the upcoming meeting. So, you know, when we get together, we focus on, we go through it real quickly, but there's three or four things that you're focusing on. Maybe those are the things you could do a summary on and send out to everybody. And that would kind of help alleviate the need for the one-on-ones every month with everybody, so. Just some high-level things to, yeah, yeah. to think about as we, as we head into approach the, the meeting. Yeah. And that, that's, that's really all I have. Thank okay. you. Any, oh, Commissioner Floyd. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to briefly say that, um, yeah, I like the idea of uh, the quarterly workshops. Um, but it, I think it still might be a little difficult if we have 19 people showing up to talk uh, about something. I don't know uh, what the solution to that is. Maybe we try to focus each one on a, just one or two topics so that we have time to get everybody heard. Um, but uh, I do think, I don't know, I think that should be considered as to how difficult it might be to have all 19 of us express our opinion. Um, so, I mean, maybe just focus could help clear that up, but um, I'm, I'm happy for us to go uh, really in either of these directions. I do think it will be necessary because I think just the board meetings will make it difficult for everybody's voice to be heard. You know, um, suggestion earlier was about our target employment industrial land study and the transit-oriented development as maybe workshop items. Um, we put items on your agenda now that are sometimes just information items, that are presentations, and it's just information, we're not ready for an action. Those could easily move to a quarterly workshop and then have the action item at the regular meeting. Uh, and we could still have some dis debate and discussion, but maybe not as free form and maybe it's a little more focused at the meeting. Just a thought. What? Anyone else? Yeah, just one last comment. Oh, Commissioner yeah. Eggers. Um, and as, as it relates to the meetings, our workshops, um, and again, this is just operational. When we have our regular board meetings, folks can come, and they get three minutes to talk about really anything that mm -hmm. they would like to talk about. Um, maybe if we want to just think along the lines of, normally in workshops, at, the, at least at the county commission, we don't take public input at those meetings. We just kind of, it's really for the commission to get together and, and discuss, in this case, this board to get together. So that's just something that we need to think what, which way we want to go in the meeting, if we want to allow comments just on those things that are, we're talking about that morning, or not have any, so we can just have our workshop. Um, and the only other thing I'd say is that um, maybe at these workshops, to the, to the point that uh, Council Member Floyd was talking about, we can have, um, a limited number of topics, but at the same time provide an open mic for board members at the end of the meeting to just bring up issues, whether we have a d deep discussion that meeting or the next quarterly meeting, um, things that are of issue. I think the Teal study, we, we, we dealt with it, but I mean the implication behind that study is really powerful, and I'm not sure that we really dove into it and had a good conversation about it. Um, 
And I would probably bring that up at the first meeting and say, let's have a that again so we can get into that more. But just yeah. kind of have an open mic at the end of the workshop that might be a. I like that idea. Good suggestion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else? C Commissioner Burke. I agree mostly with what Commissioner Agar said that uh, I'm not a fan of the committees. I'd rather have the workshops, not necessarily quarterly scheduled, but workshops as needed would be fine. Um, we have some significant changes, you know, coming to the board, but really the person that affects the most is you. So if we went with <clears throat> the as needed meetings with you, excuse me, <clears throat> and workshops as needed, and really status quo, what we've been doing now, we just have a few more people, which may need more education from you initially, but uh, it's, it's working now and it's going to change very soon. So I don't know if we need to upset the whole apple cart just because it's changing. And like I said, I feel I, it's valuable for me to stay in touch with you all regular regular basis, but I can call any of you up and text you and say we need to talk about whatever, whenever it happens. Mr. Vice Mayor Eisner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank Council Member uh, Driscoll for your response. It was excellent. Um, I agree with pretty much everything you had to say. Um, some of the things that we try to do is we try to get a draft agenda out as soon as possible so that we have time to look it over and we kind of try to at least um, get some of the issues worked out prior to the meeting so that we use the meeting as a more of a voting. Um, I'm also in favor of uh, moving towards um, workshops rather than uh, committee meetings because when you're done with the committee meetings, somehow or other the committees have to then do another presentation to the rest of the people who are not in that committee. So you kind of just, you might as well have the workshop in the first place. Um, but I did hear a lot of good comments from everybody. Uh, I think the, the crux of the matter is to just make sure that the meeting moves along and we don't spin our wheels with redundant questions and uh, make sure that we can get whatever we can get accomplished quick enough. So um, I, I'm in agreement with pretty much most of what I heard. I, I, I did hear some really good ideas and I'm looking forward to working with everybody. Thank you. You all ready for me to talk about the regional MPO? Not yet. Not yet, okay. <laughs> Hold on. Anyone else with questions? Okay, well, uh, I have a couple of, not questions, but some comments after listening to everyone's input. And, you know, I've heard different adjectives that have really taken me aback a bit because I've heard several members talk about how difficult this was going to be, how large the board was going to be, about managing the board, managing the ideas, et cetera, et cetera. The um, quarterly workshops to me I think would be invaluable because as the board grows and as our issues and problems grow that we're all dealing with, as elected officials, it gets harder and harder to keep your agenda and the timelines in your head. And it, I, it's really critical in my mind for decision making going forward for everyone to understand how far behind Pinellas County is with our public transportation opportunities and the things that we have put in place. Um, if you study, and it was Whit that really rang my bell very early on when I started to get involved with Forward Pinellas, because if you look at what has happened around the United States and those parts of the country that have really implemented really good, efficient, and productive transportation options for their citizens, there's one thing that leaps out at you if you really start to get anywhere near in the weeds. And that is they all recognized early on the necessity for a regional MPO. And if you want to get federal dollars to complete any type of project, you know what the first question the feds ask when you go to meet with our United States Congressional and Senate people? Are you here as an individual representing uh, one entity, or are you here speaking with one voice and one message 
for your region. And so with keeping that in mind, Whit, I myself, I don't know how everyone else feels, but I would really appreciate a summary or a one-page white paper that documents for everyone what the Atlanta area went through when they moved forward with regionalizing their whole area, because it doesn't seem to me that it's wise for us to try to reinvent the wheel. There are other parts of the country that have gotten this done and gotten it done really well. I think you would agree. Mm -hmm. And Atlanta sticks in my head simply because they have 25 different counties, correct me if I'm wrong, Something like that. that came together. Think about that. 25 different counties. So I'm confident that it can be done, but this board is a complicated one by virtue of all the moving parts, and you cannot just get appointed to come and represent your area if you're not willing to really do your homework and get into the weeds a little bit uh, and really become educated, because otherwise you're making decisions in a vacuum, I think. So I'd like you to respond to the Atlanta reference and maybe talk about some of the other ones as well. Because when I was in the Florida legislature, when we agreed to move forward and fund the high-speed rail line, do you remember that? And we got it passed. And guess what? We got the money from the feds. And then what did we do? We sent the money back and decided we didn't need it. I mean, how dumb was that? Okay, that was then, this is now. I'd like to think we can recognize that that might have not been the wisest thing to do and move forward. But before you talk about the other examples with, Commissioner Albritton has something to say. Commissioner? So I just want to say this for some of the new people that are here. Um, She's exactly right. Uh, we need to have a, a regional MPO. Uh, when I went to Washington to advocate for $20 million for our Clearwater Intermodal Center, and I went to the FTA uh, and sat down with those folks, uh, they thought Pinellas County was in the panhandle. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I was just blown away. They, they had no idea. I said, you know, how about we're the last part of the I-4 interchange, you know, before you get wet in the Gulf. But you know what? If we had an MPO that said Tampa Bay MPO, they're going to know who we are everywhere. So it's, you know, it is really important that we take this step. It's going to be a difficult one because we're, we're going to be merging with Hillsboro, which um, has a little more muscle. But I think we've grown. The time is now to do this, and uh, it's just really important for us to do this. So if we want to see more money from Washington, that's all. Okay, Whip, back to you. Well, I don't have um, too many details on all that, but at the TMA meeting, we did do some research on these other MPOs around the country and how they've managed governance and how they've structured themselves, and we'll be sh sharing those case studies on Friday with you at the TMA leadership group. I know uh, more of my experience in the Orlando and Charlotte regions working there and also in the, uh, some places I've worked in Texas. The uh, North Central Texas Council of Governments is a massive MPO um, that is housed within a Council of Governments, kind of like we're housed within the Pinellas Planning Council. And they serve uh, a, a very large region, fast-growing region. And there's always been this sort of sense that, well, Dallas and Fort Worth are going to take everybody's money. That has not happened because they've created a structure and a mechanism where smaller communities like McKinney and others um, to the north, Plano, they get money for what they need because they are represented and they are included in the call for projects. And they scale their projects so that not just the big, big staff organizations can compete and and apply for projects. They scale the projects so that they can distribute smaller projects. Metroplan Orlando does the same thing for a three-county area where they, um, they, they have 
broadened some of their grant programs to provide technical assistance and planning support and helping communities kind of work through some difficult issues. And that brings people together because they feel like they're getting attention. And I think that's the biggest challenge is making sure people feel represented, that they feel like they're getting attention and that they have an avenue for productive communication. So we'll bring some of those examples and whatever we share with the TMA leadership group, we'll be glad to bring back and, and provide this, this body as well. All right, so as we move into the regional MPO, that was a pretty good discussion. Um, we have some potential apportionment scenarios that I'd like you to think about. And uh, we have uh, a pretty gung-ho group at the TMA leadership group. Our representatives are Commissioner Eggers, uh, Commissioner Long, and Councilmember Driscoll. Any of you are welcome to come to those meetings, and if one of those three can't be there, you all can vote on behalf of the Ford Pinellas Board. And it's an interesting dynamic to see everybody in action. I would encourage you to go to at least one of those. Um, <laughs> the, um, so the TMA leadership group, uh, we were, we were going to take a little bit of a pause this year and uh, focus on our long-range plans and not too much on the apportionment scenarios, but they weren't having it. They said, bring us back apportionment scenarios at the very next meeting because we think this is important and we want to get this done. So um, on Friday, we will be um, walking through some of these scenarios. Um, so each MPO is having that conversation. Um, and then the goal is to provide your representatives here with some guidance on that. Um, we are spending this year to build consensus on what that apportionment plan looks like, because we think that's the stickiest question that we're going to have to answer. And if we can't answer it this year, we're probably dead in the water because legally, the city of Tampa, if they don't feel supported as the largest city in the region, they can effectively veto this under federal law. There's also some information out there that we need to confirm that that could also fall to the largest city in Pinellas County and in Pasco County um, because that's been the experience of some of the other MPOs that have merged. So we want to get everybody on board, and that this is a year for consensus building. Um, we're leading this discussion now, but beginning in 2025, as we get further on and have a framework in place, we're going to be looking at hiring an independent facilitator to provide legal and management advice on this new regional MPO. So some of this is a little bit redundant, um, but 5 to 25 members. Uh, it has to be based on equitable geographic population. The members shall include elected officials of general purpose local governments. They may include membership of statutorily authorized planning boards, such as Ford Pinellas, uh, or an official of an agency that operates a major mode of transportation. Uh, FDOT, by state statute, must be a non-voting advisor. And you can see the population breakdown effectively is about half of the regional tri-county population lies in Hillsboro, um, about 32% in Pinellas and 19% in Pasco. In 10 more years, those percentages will probably change. So this will be an evolving process with every census. So our first topic is what is an appropriate board size? Um, again, there's no uh, legal limit to the number of non-voting advisors or advisory committees. I mentioned the Orlando example where they had a, um, a local government mayor's council of smaller cities. Uh, we could do something similar there. Um, but I'd just like to get first some thoughts on what's manageable from a regional MPO perspective and what are your thoughts on that? Anybody? Commissioner Scott? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just curious if you know the answer to this question. Between the three counties now, how many total members are there? Total elected officials? Yeah, that represent the various MPOs. Oh, the various MPOs. I'll, I'll get to that. I think I have a slide for that. Do I not? You don't have that in here? It's about 35. Because I think it's 13 here, 15 in Tampa, 9 in Pasco. 7 or 9, yeah. DOT probably knows better than I do. So will that be when we go to 19? What will that be then? Does that include that? Yeah, it, it, again, it's got to be based on population, so we won't just put the boards together. Right, yeah, I'm just, I'm just as a point of reference. Just trying to... mm -hmm. So I can tell you that the general discussion in Hillsborough County was that they preferred a larger board to be more inclusive of the diversity that we have in this large region. 
Um, and, you know, they, but they also had some concerns about how manageable 25 would be. Commissioner Eggers. <clears throat> yeah, on the sticking points that you talked about earlier, um, there was some discussion about, yeah, because I think there is value to having ports, the major ports um, at the table, you know, like uh, our shipping, Tampa Bay shipping port and the airport and, you know, that kind of thing. So, but the question was, do those members, um, are they going towards the count for Hillsborough County mm -hmm. or are they kind of taken off the top before they start dividing it up so that, again, you know, it, you can see the population is so close that it would, you know, you're, you're not, you're, what you're trying to do is have a, a, a balancing situation. And I think if you have the numbers by population and then they add on the ports themselves, uh, I think there's an issue. Now, I don't, I'm not sure these, these, these ports are independently funded or how they're funded, how their revenue streams are funded, where they come from and who, you know, butters their bread, so to speak. I don't, I really don't know that. But I mean, that will be an important piece to this as well. Um, and if we can handle 19, 25 is not a big deal mm -hmm. you know, to me. But I think the breakdown is going to be really important. Be are those really regional ports or re regional or are they Hillsboro? Just because they're in Hillsboro doesn't make them Hillsboro. Right, right. I jumped to the t second topic because it's interrelated to the size of the board. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the role of transportation operators and the size of the board, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways we could look at it. Uh, these are the examples of some of the operators. Um, you know, in my view, the Tampa International Airport or the Aviation Authority, uh, the Port Tampa Bay, Port Authority, they truly are um, regional operators because they draw people um, and, and distribute goods throughout the region. Clearly, but what's interesting about that is their their governing boards are comprised only of representatives from Hillsborough County. So, you know, maybe there's a maybe there's a trade-off there. Maybe we say if you want a seat on the regional MPO as the Port Tampa Bay or Aviation Authority, maybe you need to revisit your board structure and consider representation from the other two counties as a condition of that. And, and as a point to that, I have for a long, long time, been really irritated about the fact that the airport and the ports refer to themselves as, you know, representing the entire region, but their boards don't reflect that. And in that list of folks that you have down there, I don't know why in the world we wouldn't include Clearwater, St. Pete, Pi, our own airport, because I could make a strong case for the fact that they are regional too. That's true. They, um, that airport falls under the Board of County Commissioners. So theoretically, the Board of County Commissioners represents them when they're on the regional board, but that's a, a good point. Another argument could probably be made for Visit St. Pete Clearwater and our beaches, regional asset. That's right. But who owns the beaches? They're divided among 10 or 11 different cities. Um, so we don't really have like a beach authority, but you know, uh, clearly a regional asset. Uh, Commissioner Driscoll, and then... Thank you. Can you go uh, back one slide? So, if there's no limit to the number of non-voting advisors, could the... Could those entities have representation but not... but be non-voting? So they're at the table and I, I, I see value in that because of their expertise and, and what, they can, what they can share and weigh in on. But then when it comes to voting, that could be the representation that's in proportion with the populations of each county. Has, I, think the I don't recall a discussion about that on, on TMA, so. That'll be Friday, <laughs> so you'll get that. Yeah. I think we've had a little bit of a discussion, but not much. Um, the, give you an example, the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority only operates in, in Hillsborough County. Legally, they can operate in Pasco or Pinellas County, but they have to be invited in by the county commission, and then they have to have a project. 
Um, we had the THEA as the acronym, we had them look at Kenner at 611, McMullen Booth, a few years ago, and the price tag scared everybody off. Um, if Theoretically, if they, brought, they had a, a, a project in one of the other counties, they could be considered. But currently, they could be a great non-voting advisor because they have technical expertise about toll systems and, and how they operate and where they see the growth in the region happening, for sure. The discussion at the Hillsborough MPO last week or so was to look at those operators as staff at the board and have them be voting and have them off the top so that they're not counted against the Hillsboro allocation. And I'll tell you, and I think FDOT can back me up on this, the meetings I've watched, those operators do think regionally and they do vote regionally and they don't vote parochially. And um, that's sometimes been a source of conflict in Hillsborough County. Right. Because the argument has been that they're not accountable because you all are elected officials and if people get mad at how you vote, they can, they can challenge you in the next election. Uh, you can't really do that to the CEO of the Aviation Authority. So that's been some of the tension that I've seen. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the airports and the seaports are not only the gateway to the world, but they're also integral to interstate commerce. So I think it's very important that they be represented. Now, I'm not saying they all have to individually have a seat. Maybe it's one that rotates among them or something like that. But I do think it's very important that we find a way to, to have them represented on this new board. Okay. Boyd, did you have something? Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, Mike, please. I put my hand up. Uh, but since then, I think Commissioner Scott pretty much summed up exactly what I was going to say, which was uh, I think um, I like your idea about, you know, having a conversation with him about, uh, especially the, the port and the airport, um, about, you know, truly becoming representative of Tampa Bay. Um, but I definitely think, you know, regardless of how that conversation goes, their input's important. Um, but I think we found creative ways here with rotating seats um, to get people in. And, uh, you know, it sort of goes back to the same conversation that we ha have had about how we include voices who are, aren't at our table here. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if that looks like uh, a advisory board or committee or some of, of some sort that, I don't know, maybe has their representative uh, that rotates um, on that committee as well as, you know, the heads of the other groups and they meet regularly and they can share feedback with us. Um, you know, those, I'm just uh, sort of brainstorming. Um, but I definitely think like to get their input would be important, but I, I really see the problem with um, like Hillsborough's having now a lot of appointed people, uh, a lot of appointed officials instead of elected officials on the board. That does, I think that would create uh, tension between the elected officials and the appointed officials. You just have a different perspective and uh, respond to public opinion more if you are uh, elected than appointed. So. I think we could get creative, uh, but I do think their voice will be important. Okay. Any other thoughts? I want to make sure we have time for other agenda items. So, um. Commissioner Rutgers. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll be brief. Um, I, I don't. I agree with Commissioner Scott and a few of the others, Commissioner uh, Councilmember Floyd, that we need to have them at the table for sure. They're they're critical pieces. The only issue was not really whether they should be on there or not, but how they should be incorporated onto the board's decision-making ability. And um, I, I, I like the idea that they're voting members, but I also like the idea that if they are truly going to be a regional member, that they need to be, their board needs to be representative of that region. And if the three counties are going to be coming together as an MPO, then those three counties need to have a seat. I don't know how many seats the Hillsborough County Commission has at the two ports. One? I don't know for I, sure. I have no idea. It may be a minimal number, so there's not that much influence. They may not get any tax dollars. They may get nothing from the county commission. So in a sense, just by that very nature, it is more regional. That's a conversation we can have. That's, I don't have all that information. That's a good point. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on this topic? Anybody? 
TMA representatives, do you feel like you've heard and gotten some good guidance for Friday's meeting? Yeah, I can't wait till Friday. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, I think we're gonna move on then to, uh, well, let's see. I do have some information here. <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea said I didn't have uh, this information. So uh, just a little bit of background for the transportation operators. The, these are the respective sizes of the different boards. So elected officials, Hillsborough has 11, Pasco 9, we have 13. So we win in terms of elected officials. Um, but then they have four um, operators and then they have one planning board. So their total board composition, um, much higher number of non-elected appointed officials. We've talked about all these points, so this is not anything new, but now you can see how the three MPOs differ. Okay, so uh, in terms of apportionment as we move forward, we're not ready to talk about this today, but n maybe over the spring, is what do we do about our small cities? There's been a push um, from the mayor of Temple Terrace, who is the chair of the MPO board, or maybe vice chair of the Hillsborough MPO board, to have a small cities committee, and one of those people serves on the, the voting on the regional MPO. And that's how Orlando does it. Uh, and you know that obviously weighs in Pinellas' favor because we have, what, 17 or 18 small cities um, compared to two or three in the other counties. Um, we could also look at subcommittees, uh, for example, to address tourism, economic development, job training, education, freight, uh, and pr planning and development. And those subcommittees could be just staff. Um, or they could be um, subject matter experts, however we want to bring that together. But those are some things we can think about down the road. And with that, we'll move on to the next agenda item, Madam Chair, if that's okay. Um, hold on one second. Okay, sure, Mayor Wajowski. Wajowski. My apologies for being late. I had a, a work meeting this morning. Um, I, I do want to just say for that future topic, one, you know, in case I'm not here, for it, because uh, I will be off this lovely board as of the end of October. Um, but I do think it's really important with all the cities that we have here in Pinellas County um, that we have representation somehow. I mean, one of the greatest things I've ever done has been a part of this board and gotten things done for our community. And I worry that I won't be able to do that anymore. Not, not me personally, but our community. We have three state roads that go through our community. Um, we have a lot of issues that happen from a traffic perspective. As you know, we have all the cars on our road from tourism. So I, I worry a lot that smaller cities or cities in general, besides the real large ones, don't get a say. And that when we have a regional board, it will be solely focused on regional things. And I mean, We've done a great job here at looking at what Pinellas County needs. I'm not sure how that's going to get incorporated into a regional board. I don't know what the answer is, and I, I know we don't need to debate it today, but I'm just putting that out for my concern um, for our county going forward. Thank you. Good point. Uh, what I'll say to that is that um, first, successful MPOs of a regional scale know how to telescope. So they know how to pay attention to the big regional issues, but they also know how to do the micro issues as well. And Atlanta Regional Commission is a good example of that uh, for the MPO, is they've created a Livable Communities Grant Program that they have funded a ton of planning activities and construction activities, a lot of it around transit-oriented development and, and small city like infill development and strategies for housing. And that's made it less of a big beast, it's made it more relevant to those smaller communities. Orlando has done the same thing. So I think that's a, that telescoping is gonna be really important. Second thing that I said a little bit earlier but you may have missed is that uh, I don't see Ford Pinellas as an entity going away with this regional MPO because we have the Pinellas Planning Council and it has the mission of aligning land use and transportation and has a transportation planning framework responsibility to a degree. So it could be that we create a Ford Pinellas board that is an advisory board to the regional MPO that represents those small cities uniquely to us. Um, again, a lot of options that we can consider as we go forward. A lot of strings to pull. All right, uh, Chelsea, are you ready to step into the limelight?
All right, guys, can you pull up the long range plan presentation? There we go. All right, well, I'm Chelsea Favero. I'm staff here with Ford Pinellas, and I'm gonna walk you through Advantage Pinellas 2050. So Advantage Pinellas is our long range plan for the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. It's really a strategic plan to improve mobility and economic opportunity countywide. And really what we, the main thing that we need to think about when we think about the long range plan is it aligns our investments with the land use future that we want in our communities. And if a project is not in the long range plan, it is not eligible to receive state or federal funding. We update or develop a new long range plan every five years to account for changes in policy, population, demographics, mobility needs. Um, and so we're in the process of that right now, developing the next one. So this process does take a couple of years. We started last spring in 2023, developing uh, population and employment projections. Uh, we started identifying our mobility needs for all modes of transportation. Uh, we've just started with our projection of revenues between now and 2050, because the long range plan must be cost feasible, which means that it has to be balanced, the cost of the projects against the revenue that we can reasonably anticipate uh, being available for those projects throughout the horizon of the plan. So in the spring, we're gonna start balancing those projects against the revenues that we believe we'll have, and then we're gonna be bringing this plan back to you for adoption at your October meeting. So when we look at our long range plan for Pinellas County and all of our mobility needs, we know that we're not in a vacuum. We know that you know, we are just one piece of the broader region. So looking at our regional growth, we worked very closely with our partners in Hillsboro and Pasco. We've also been coordinating with Manatee, uh, Sarasota, all the way up through Citrus County to ensure that the projections of growth that we're developing kind of complement each other, make sense, they work well with one another. So I wanted to share with you some of the numbers that our regional partners um, are looking at as well. Hillsborough County is looking to add an additional 540,000 people and 430,000 jobs between now and 2050. Pasco, about another 450,000 people and 240,000 jobs. So by 2050, for a three county region, we're looking to have a total population of about 4 million residents. And I apologize for the typo there. Uh, the tourists, that's not 40 million, it's actually 30 million. So our region had 30 million tourists last year alone. So that's a lot of people that we're planning for moving forward. When we look at Pinellas County specifically, obviously our growth numbers aren't quite as big as our surrounding counties. Uh, there's a lot of development going on in the more rural areas uh, next door, but we are still looking to add another 120,000 people and 90,000 ad uh, additional jobs between now and 2050 just in Pinellas County. Those maps up there, the darker the color, that's where we, we plan to see the most increase in jobs and populations um, over the course of this uh, next several uh, decades, bless you. Uh, a lot of this growth is concentrated along our corridors and in our activity centers. And this is really where the countywide plan has set up the land uses to be able to absorb that growth. And it's where our transportation network can really absorb those additional trips. Um, and in addition to all of that growth, we do have more than 15 million annual visitors here uh, in Pinellas County. So that's a lot of people moving around on our roadways and on our trails that we really need to plan for going into the future. Uh, when we look at our regional travel patterns, and I apologize, there's a lot of data on this slide, but you know, we often hear from our neighbors to the east, oh, everyone comes into Hillsborough County every day for their jobs. When we looked at journey to work data, we've got about 68,000 people, yes, that are going every day from Pinellas into Hillsborough County, but going in the opposite direction, it's about 64,000 people each day. So it's a pretty even split of people who are crossing uh, the bay. And we even went back to 2002 uh, to look at those numbers. And it, it's definitely come a little bit further along in terms of that split, where you know 20 years ago, we did have more people going into Hillsborough than coming into Pinellas, but that's really evened out. And then looking at some of our other counties, we've seen a pretty significant increase in trips from Pasco into Pinellas County, although Pasco is now sending a larger percentage of their commuters into Hillsborough County. And even from Manatee, we've seen some significant increases coming up over the Skyway. Chelsea, just to clarify that those are just work trips? They're just work trips. Those are not social recreation or entertainment or anything right. like These that? These are just for jobs. Chelsea? Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, on the population that we have today for the three counties, mm -hmm. if we get see a table that shows, and maybe you can get that information to us, what that's forecasted to be in 2050, um, as it relates to the apportionment for the regional NPO, 
I don't. I think one of the things that we're going to put forward, we should put forward this week, is that no one NPO can have more than 50 percent of the board members, and yet one of the one of the requirements is this population-driven mix. One of the things that Pasco County and Pinellas County said, well, if we work together, you know, and just say we're going to work, it never works that way. But I mean, you could always kind of veto Hillsborough you know, in, in a move to be, uh, put a program together that's not really regionally based. Um, so, I, you know, it'd be interesting to see those, I can't remember, you just threw those up there, but what, what those numbers look like in 2050. Mm -hmm. um, because I could see that changing over time and Hillsborough then wanting, all of a sudden you've got a Hillsborough, her, you know, dominated board. And back to what Mayor Brzezowski mentioned, then we really start losing I mean, we're talking theoretically here, right? We're not saying that's that we hear that's their plan, that's their motivation, but I think that's something we need to be thinking about too. As we have that conversation on Friday, don't be a, you'll, you'll never have a majority on here, but MPOs, report, the population thing may put that to rest. Anyway, yeah, just a comment. That's a good point. We can certainly have that data provided. One thing I have heard pretty consistently when I've gone to Hillsborough MPO meetings is the city of Tampa does not feel like they are adequately represented today. And you may have heard that at one of our TMA meetings where one of their council members said, we should double our representation because the number of people coming in daily for jobs is double, but those aren't voters. They're just workers, right? So there's a, there's a sense there that Tampa feels like they don't have their pull that they should today. Probably then we need to throw tourism into that number that's as right. well. Yeah. Then, then, then there's a balancing, you know, that's ridiculous, but yeah, go ahead. Thank you. All right, so to kickstart our long range plan, because transportation doesn't happen only within one county, we conducted a regional needs assessment where we worked with all of the counties that you see on this map here, um, all the way up from Citrus down to Sarasota and out to Polk, and we conducted a regional needs assessment. And we looked at regional travel demand, congestion, safety, and from all that, we identified the corridors that are most critical for regional travel. And what we're doing with this data is we've given this back to each of those individual MPOs, and there is a commitment that through the development of their individual LRTPs, that they will include projects and strategies that help support the movement of people and goods along these corridors in a safe manner. So all of us are going to be working towards the similar vision. Um, so also with the long range plan, it's not just us sitting in our offices coming up with ideas for what projects we want to see included. Uh, we do a lot of uh, public outreach. Uh, earlier last year in 2023, we did a statistically valid survey of the public to find out, you know, we, we hear a lot of very strong voices when people are either really excited or really upset. So we do a statistically valid survey to really get the full gamut of what are the residents in general saying here in Pinellas County and not just the ones that we may hear you know, from the dais on a typical day. Um, what we're hearing is people want options uh, here in Pinellas County. They want options in how they get around, and the ability to safely walk and bike is very important to our residents. Uh, more than 70% of people that responded to the survey said that they want to have a variety of land uses within a 10-mile walk of their home. And that really speaks to the land development pattern that we have here in Pinellas County. There's a lot of uses. We have a lot of commercial kind of distributed around. We don't have a lot of single family gated communities um, stretching all throughout the county. There's a good diversity of land uses. We also asked a question as to whether or not our residents would take transit. 20% of them said absolutely not, never will do it. However, half of them said that they would likely take it if it could get them around more quickly. Um, biking and pedestrian and safety investments are highly supported by our residents. Uh, that was closely followed by roadway maintenance and premium transit. And we, and we asked what uh, uh, that specific question about transit. Uh, transit was really, really highly supported if it was quote unquote premium um, or regional in nature. Those two types of services had a lot of support. And um, also on that last bullet there, more than 70% of the respondents would support lower speeds for safer streets. And this is very consistent with what we heard about five years ago in our last statistically valid survey, and really paints the picture that our residents here, they want us to be improving safety through our investments. They want us to be investing in all modes of transportation, not just widening roads um, and things like that. 
So Advantage Pinellas, as Whit had mentioned earlier, we focus on what are the advantages of living and working in Pinellas County. So up on the screen, these are the goals uh, that we have for our long range plan. And then we're, we divide up the plan as to how we're going to achieve these goals through our investments in transportation. And then how we meet them are through these four items here. Connectivity, sorry, five, can't count. Roadway efficiency, technology, active transportation, and transit service. So when we look at roadway efficiency and in capacity on our network, we don't have a whole lot of roadway projects left here in Pinellas County to complete. A lot of our roadway network, if we were to widen those roads any further, we'd be taking out businesses and residences, and we really don't want to do that. But there are some strategic areas that we can invest in. US 19 is one example in the northern corridor north of Curley Road, where we're looking at interchanges and exploring a viaduct concept. You'll all hear more about that at a later meeting. There are still some investments left to be made along the I-275 corridor in the construction of express lanes and lane continuity improvements. And then we also have some key local connections. 126th Avenue North in the Pinellas Park area is one that comes to mind. It dead ends at several places and does not connect all the way through. Same with 142nd Avenue in the Largo area. And then over in the St. Petersburg area, Halkey Roberts 102nd. So we do still have some opportunities to expand roadway capacity or invest in additional efficiency through intersection improvements. Uh, you see the picture there of the roundabout construction. We really need to look at ways to invest more efficiently um, because as you see on the inter interchange on the right, you can only kind of go so high and so wide with these upper deck uh, roadway constructions. And I believe you probably don't want to see a roadway like that um, all across Pinellas County. Investments in technology is something that we've worked really hard with our partners at Pinellas County and the municipalities on. Uh, the county has invested heavily in the Intelligent Transportation System Network, uh, laying fiber throughout Pinellas County to connect the um, signals. Uh, we're working on detection improvements where the signals better detect, um, first it was motorcycles, the, the loops in the roadway couldn't detect the motorcycles very well, now they're doing that better, so now we're looking to improve that even more for signals to detect when a bicyclist is standing there or a pedestrian. Um, advanced notification equipment like our uh, dynamic messaging signs to get the word out if there is a traffic issue ahead and so people can take alternative routes. And we're also working right now to identify opportunities to expand funding to better support our local partners. Active transportation is uh, an area that we have invested heavily in uh, as, as a region, um, but also here in Pinellas County with the construction of the Pinellas Trail Loop in partnership with Pinellas County. And when we say active transportation, that's not a one size fits all approach. Really what we mean is it's a dedicated space to improve safety that's sensitive to the context of the area. More than 75% of our fatalities in Pinellas County are vulnerable users. That includes motorcycles, bicyclists, and pedestrians. So as we develop this plan, we have to look at how best we can invest our dollars in some of these improvements. With the adopted plan, we had committed to constructing a number of um, bicycle trails. And in addition to that, we agreed or committed to constructing four overpasses for our trail crossings. Some of those overpasses we've realized um, are not feasible because of their location and proximity to uh, power lines. Um, some of them are feasible, but moving forward, you know, the latest cost estimate that we have for a pedestrian overpass was $9 million. Compared to that, we're doing a bicycle pedestrian crossing enhancement at Gulf to Bay and Old Coachman Road. That was only $1.5 million. So we need to think about these trade-offs in cost and safety as we develop the next plan and allocate dollars to these types of projects, what, what, what's the right mix for investment and how many of these should we be funding? Commissioner Eggers? On the, back to the, the fatalities, the 75% of fatalities are vulnerable users. Mm -hmm. Has there been a study done on, um, on those actual fatalities that occurred where, it doesn't really matter in the end, you know, the, the deaths are not acceptable, but who was at fault? In other words, is it the vulnerable users that were at fault in their own fatality, or was it the system, the infrastructure that's in place, or maybe somebody that's not a vulnerable user, the cause of the fatality? I, I mean, I think about, you know, and Whit and I have this discussion a lot, but um, I'm, I'm getting of the mindset that everybody should stop at the trail, and the trail should be no stops, because it, Bikes don't stop. 
no matter how much we try to educate, no matter how much we try to, they don't stop. So if, we, we're, if we're stopping, then we're taking away that interaction. Um, and, it, and, and so I think about that, and I think you know about some other place. There's a place right in Clearwater where you have that, where you cross, and it just says stop. Everybody must stop. There's no stopping on the trail, and we have different. That's different all the way through the county. There's no consistency, and there's an issue with uh, there's an issue with uh, bikes in that case. Motorcycles. Many of them are great at, at following the rules and laws and everything, but some of them are not. And they become the, so is there a breakdown there on who's at fault? And so is it educational or is it, you know? It's a little bit of everything. And we honestly go in and I personally read every single fatal crash report and we try to identify is there a trend? And I will tell you, it's, it's all across the board. There's no one single trend. Ideally, a transportation network that is safe is one that, you know, doesn't put people in a situation where even if they make a mistake, that does not result in a fatality. Um, so there are definitely improvements when it was the fault of a pedestrian or when it was a fault of a, a car driver, a vehicle. Um, so that, that data is out there, but there's no one single trend on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then when we come to the conversation about transit, our transit system, you know, we need to look at connecting major destinations and attractions, connections to employment centers, but also our options for those 15 million tourists and 30 minute 30 million regional tourists that we t talked about earlier. Um, with transit, you know, it's not just running buses. There are, um, there's Brightline coming into Orlando with the desire to connect over into Tampa. There are discussions about urban air mobility. There's lots of different modes that are gonna be part of the conversation as we develop this long range plan and consider where our investment should be. All right, so this map right here, and I apologize, some lines are a little bit tough to see, but these show our major investment corridors, and these are also the corridors that we're targeting for addi additional transit investment going into the future. This shows how those lines connect with our target employment centers, and as you can see, these lines really get to those target employment areas, such as around um, State Road 60 and Clearwater, the Gateway Center, and then points beyond. We did a study back in 2016 that looked at the feasibility of bike share, um, and this heat map kind of shows the areas that have the highest propensity um, for a successful bike share program. Um, and you'll see, you know, the concentrations in Clearwater, St. Petersburg, but also going out along the Central Avenue corridor and in other communities. When we compare that map to this one here that shows our intermodal centers, they really align pretty well. There are still some areas that aren't reflected on this map, like downtown Dunedin and in our beach communities, that would still be excellent options for micromobility. But we really want to look at the areas where people are coming and going on their transit services, maybe change, um, getting to a destination, but they still have about a mile to walk to their final destination after they get off the bus. And so micromobility may be the most effective in some of those areas. Sorry, I didn't realize there were so many movements in this. Um, so this comes to our final map of our re major regional connections. And these are the corridors that, um, obviously the Sunrunner corridor is on there, uh, the Alt-19 corridor that we've been studying for the last couple of years. Um, but we're also trying to identify what's the next major corridor that we should be looking at to focus on from both a land use and a transportation perspective going forward. And these are the corridors that we really believe are gonna be those that house those major regional uh, investments going forward. Waterborne transportation is obviously going to be um, a big part of our long range plan. You know, we're surrounded by water on three sides, so we don't want to overlook this. We're going to be looking at connecting major destinations and attractions um, in the Clearwater, Dunedin area, down through the intercoastal, but also connecting uh, downtown St. Petersburg over to downtown Tampa and a potential connection over to the Apollo Beach area. And this will provide connections not just for employees, um, but also for our tourists um, and other residents. 
So coming up next in our long range plan, we've kind of come that far to start identifying some of those needs. Um, we're gonna be developing those pr projections of financial resources. That way we know how much money we have to work with for the coming 20 years when we develop that plan. Then we'll start identifying those projects with support for funding, and then we'll start balancing them out. And you all will be brought along all or along the way as we come up with that final list of projects that will be a part of the long range plan. And to help get us there, do you have those pages? Uh, we have an exercise for each day. Um, as we develop a long-range plan, there are lots of different funding types and you know, different ways to invest in our transportation projects. And so we are looking for your guidance on how you believe the transportation dollars should be invested um, on various modes um, through the long-range plan. And this will be really important to us so when we start balancing out those projects, we know where to put those yeah. funds and on what projects. Oh, Madam Chair. Yes. Just comment. Um, so when you were a couple slides back and you were putting all of the regional um, pieces down there from a long range plan, mm -hmm. um, I don't see in there the, um, the rail right of way that goes really through Pinellas County and into, to me, those are things that need to be on our long range um, regional connection piece. Correct, and the CSX will be. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not on this exact map. This was okay. more of a land use transportation map at this point and some more near term things, but the CSX will remain a, a priority uh, for, for this LRTP. Yeah, well, I don't, I mean, again, I'm not, I don't know what kind of priority at this point, but mm -hmm. certainly that right of way goes through all of the, all, all, all of the regional. The, and the only other thing is, is that from where we are today to long range, which is, you know, 2050, mm -hmm. I, you know, I brought it up at, at PSTA meeting, but I, I think we need to be thinking of, about pilot programs that, that we can try out because these are huge investments that we're talking about from a long range perspective. Mm -hmm. And it would make a lot more sense if we had some data mm -hmm. that started to address specific needs in, in areas without making huge investments. So, um, and there's a way to market it you know, that would be put into play in three years from now, you market it the right way, and you tell people what it's gonna be for, and see if it's used. Um, I just think that's something that we need to do more of um, to see if there's really an appetite okay. uh, going forward. So anyway, right, thank you just a couple of comments. And then the piece of paper in front of you, so obviously the modes of transportation are much more nuanced than what you see in front of you. There's just a single picture and an, a request that you rank them. Um, but what we'd like you to do is take a look and rank from, I believe it's one to six, one being your highest priority for investment, six being your lowest. And then there's some lines underneath it and we'd like you to spell out what that means to you. So if you say, okay, it's definitely roadways. Does that mean improving the signals for you? Does that mean widening the roadways? Does that mean operational improvements? Um, do you wanna see a roundabout at every intersection? Uh, whatever, whatever you feel. Um, same for the bike ped projects. You know, is that more sidewalks? Is it more bike lanes? Is it more dedicated trails? <coughs> we really wanna to get to the nuance of what you're thinking um, about these types of investments. And most importantly, please write your name at the top of the page or else our legal will not be happy with us. We have to put my name on this thing? You have to put your name on it. Yes, Dave. <laughs> my son's teacher would say. You know, We're not going to leak anything to the media. Yeah. <laughs> it's only for staff consumption. Does it have to be my name? It has to be your name. E R S, but yes. <laughs> One thing that um, Chelsea may have mentioned briefly is that when we do our cost feasible plan, we're gonna have to identify projects by five year bandwidths based on the revenue that we expect to come in. So some things will be done in say 2030 to 2035, and then we look at what would happen maybe in 2035 to 2040, and we build that out to 2050.
really should have added Jeopardy music to all this. I did what one? Jeopardy music. Oh, okay. You can sing if you like. You can hum. Oh, do you win a prize if you're the first one to finish? Um. You'll get $5 million if you're the first one to finish. I'm done. Well, if you finish that part um, at the very bottom yeah, of the sheet, oh, okay. um, well, if you're done, um, it, there's a list there. We'd like to know what your top three projects are that you'd like to see in the long range plan um, uh, upon adoption. Any three transportation projects you can think of. And those three projects aren't necessarily constrained by money. Mm -hmm. So if you want it in the plan, it might go in the needs plan if we don't have the money for it. But I think it's still valuable to say what you think we ought to be identifying as a project. Then we'll figure out the money later. Wit, if you'd like, while they're working, lunch is here and we can pass it out while they're doing that since we could catch up on some time that way. If y'all are okay with that, um, we'll pass out the lunches, sure. Do what? Pass out lunches. We have lunch. Chelsea, are you talking about specific, proje specific projects or are you talking about more headline style projects? Uh, for the bottom three, we are yeah. looking for specific projects. Did want to, I did want to share something with you. Um, I know we spoke about um, the water connections, but I would hope that we would also have good um, sub movement from once they get from one side to the other. Yes. So yeah, I mean, thought it was obvious, but I just wanted to make mention. Thank, Thank you. you. Chelsea, are you planning to open it up for some dialogue once they finish? Yeah, I was going to say we do have about five minutes um, still. So if we wanted to open it up and have a couple members talk about what they put down, um, we definitely have some time for that. I want to see if anybody wants to share any of their observations. Uh, just, yes, does anyone want to share their observations with the rest of the group? Commissioner Albritton? <laughs> you got um, okay. So my one through six microphone. Okay. Um, so I think I think because I'm also on PSTA that this might have some. I think premium transit will drive more people to bus travel and. I know we think about this every year, how we're going to do that and until we can get shorter route times. I think that's real important. So I made that number one. Number two was local transit. And local transit, I think, allows for more density in areas and cities. I know Clearwater's struggling with that. Uh, in some areas, we'd like to have higher density, but we need to make the routes, the transit routes, uh, better. Number three, bicycle pedestrians. Safer streets for pedestrians and micromobility is important. Um, and uh, four, regional premium transit. Um, you know, it's important that we have that to be able to connect our regional, um, Tampa to Clearwater, let's say. Uh, going north and south from our different counties. Uh, I see that in around 
uh, the country when I travel and you have regional transit connecting major uh, cities, it's so much nicer to have that. Um, number five to me was technology, smart traffic signals create shorter transit times and, and also safer. So uh, safety kind of plays into a big thing with me. And then number six, automobile. I was just finishing this. I, could, I think complete streets should be integrated more for safety for that kind of ties into the bi bicycle pedestrian, but also for automobile. Um, I think we do a better job of that. So. I think the Tarpon Springs for the record. Uh, Vice Mayor Eisner and then Commissioner Gerard. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Madam Chair, um, so my, my first was technology, and um, I say this because I think people today are mostly di <clears throat> distracted while they're driving, and uh, I know that there's a number of times that, as uh, Whit Blanton and I are both e-bikers, I've made mention that there are numerous locations where you need like a, almost a, a train rail to come down because um, drivers just, they run it, and so do the bicyclists. And when you have two, uh, somebody's going to get hurt. Um, so that's my, my thinking, is to get better technology to also do um, motion sensors so that the bicyclist does not have to stop, because they're not going to anyway, and hit a button. We could just have the motion sensor uh, triggered and um, flights would flash and at least inform uh, the, the motorist that there's someone there. I do realize that there are limitations in Dunedin. It would be a little bit of a hindrance because the light would flash all the time. But those are specific areas that we can alter it and maybe not use it there. But it doesn't mean that we can't use it in so many other places where we have issues. So everything that we could suggest has a place and, and not everything is, is suited for everywhere. Um, I then chose bicycle, pedestrian. Um, we, we're getting so many people hit on bicycles. It's not funny. I don't think anybody reads the sign that says bicycle um, can, can use the full road way. Um, so I, I don't know how better to maybe make it a flashing light um, since we're doing more flashing stop signs. Um, but people have to be aware. I just think they see this, uh, this sign and ignore it or don't even notice it. Um, I'm not a fond uh, person on roundabouts. Um, I think we need a little bit, and this is across the board, um, having more law enforcement. We have speeding that has been at a, uh, a premium in all of Pinellas County. And it's pretty much everywhere. It's it's a me me first, get out of my way type, um, you know, drivers. I just the other day on Pinellas, um, on 19 rather, I, I had somebody almost take off the front of my my vehicle just because I, I may have been even in the way or not going fast enough. I am an old man. I drive like an old man. <laughs> my wife will tell you that's exactly how I drive. But anyway, um, I do agree with council member. Albrighton is your name. Um, the we really need to do regional premium transit to the uh, beaches. I think we're really losing out on that. And uh, I really didn't have too much to say on premium transit, um, but on local transit, especially where uh, I am from, um, I would lean more towards trying to get more Lyft and Uber people in, because unless you can get to the uh, mass transit, it doesn't really help you um, unless you're living in one of the locations off 19, because that's really where our main um, mode of transportation is on 19, and we do have some on Alt 19. But if you're, I'm 15 minutes outside the city going west, I couldn't see myself doing that. And the other issue that we do have is a lot of people these days with the finances, as we spoke about earlier, also are doing two jobs 
and they may be able to get to one job with the transit, but they can't get to both. So it still involves you having to have a, a vehicle. So that's my take on that. Good observation. Anybody else want to share? Commissioner Gerard. Uh, thank you. Um, I was very pleased to hear that, uh, or to see that uh, I agree 100% with uh, Commissioner All Britain's uh, ranking, uh, premium transit and local transit, uh, bicycle pedestrian safety, uh, regional premium transit, uh, technology, and then automobiles. Um, we're already built out on, on traffic lanes. There's just no more room for that. And the roads degrade at, you know, at a faster pace than we can, than we can add lanes. Um, I happen to be a big fan of roundabouts. Uh, they're traffic calming devices. They move traffic better than signalization. And uh, I, would, I would just love to see uh, an emphasis on that and encouraging communities and in our long-range transit uh, plans to uh, put roundabouts everywhere that they're possible. I, I truly believe that that would make a big difference in the way that we can move around. Uh, as far as um, regional premium transit, it's not just east-west, it's north-south. Uh, we're going to have a lot more folks coming from Pasco uh, down to St. Pete to work. And the more that we can give them express bus service or express transit service, uh, the easier it's going to make it, and it's going to take a lot of uh, congestion off the roads. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more comments. If anybody's got a real burning desire to share, I thought I saw Commissioner Scott and uh, Patty? Mayor Bajowski. Thank you. Or in Patty. Um, okay. I think, thank you. I think when we're also looking at some of these, and it kind of touches on everybody's, is that we look at to utilizing a lot of our, our local, what we already have, you know, our Ubers and our, our Lyfts and our private companies that can it helps support the communities that we're getting the people to if we utilize local businesses to do that and that we look at the ease of it we want to make it quick we want to make it fast so people can get there they can shop and when we're doing these just remember just local you know try to utilize a lot of the local stuff instead of the big fast transit and that kind of was fast yes but local use i guess is what i'm trying to say yep thank you Commissioner Scott, and then Commissioner Mayor Bajowski. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I rank technology as, as number one. Um, I think if we can use technology to to route and manage traffic better, I think that I think that benefits the the entire county. Um, number two, I had for automobile uh, improvements to intersections, and I'm a, I'm a fan of roundabouts as well. I think they do manage traffic really really pretty well. I think those two things between technology and um, intersection and road improvements can move, can benefit the most people. Number three was bicycle and pedestrian. Um, I think we need, we need more facilities for that and safer facilities. When it came to transit, I think local transit is where we get the best bang for our buck. But I think local and premium sometimes can be, can be one and the same. If you can improve, if you can have more frequent service locally, that becomes premium in, 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 in many ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be a dedicated lane or, or, or flashy, um, flashy stations. I think if it's just better service, then it becomes premium and people, people will use it more. I ranked regional, regional transit last, but a thought that I had at our last, I think one of our last PSDA meetings was looking at implementing some sort of a tourist-based service between you know, years ago it was it was discussed at PSTA to have Clearwater Beach to a Tampa International connection, and uh, it never really really went anywhere. It was talked about a lot, but you know we have two cross bay routes right now, the 100x and 300x, that were set up for commuters probably 20 plus years ago, and that they just never really took off. I mean, they are really one of uh, PSTA's two as lower performing routes. So I think what what needs to happen there is evaluate them to see if they're even relevant anymore. If they are relevant, now that PSDA has this van pool service, see if, if that's more appropriate for those to be moved into a van pool. And then look at reallocating those resources to establishing that tourist link between Clearwater, Clearwater Beach, and Tampa International Airport. 
considering the number of millions of car trips that, that that tourists bring to our roadways every year, and looking at what that massive traffic jam trying to get across um, uh, State Road 60 down to the beaches every year, we might actually have a fighting chance of, of having an impact in congestion if we were able to do that. And understanding that, I think it's in 2028, Brightline is hoping to have a connection with Tampa. If we can establish a tourist-based service that's successful, well then you are, all you have to do is connect the dot to Ybor City. So I think that's something that we should really take a close look at. Mayor Wojcicki. Sorry. <laughs> I was so interested in Commissioner Scott's comments. I'm going to start shoveling food in my face. My apologies. I agree with what he said as far as the tourist thing. It's on my list. But I did rank, and because of the tourist thing, I actually ranked premium transit number one because in my head I was thinking about tourists using it from Central Pinellas to, the air, to d different airports. You know, so that's why one of the reasons I, I made that number one. I did regional transit as number two, again, connecting the airport over there, just connecting people and thinking about Orlando coming to Tampa, and I know that's private commuters, but that's okay too. And then them coming over to us. Number three, I put local transit because we need to get our tourists around on things like Jolly Trolley, which needs to have a better frequency and waterborne transportation. So, and then I went four on technology, but I will say that I think technology can be built into all of this. So it's not because I really thought technology is number four. Number five, bike, ped, and number six, automobile. We got plenty of automobiles. Um, so the, the top projects, was Central Pinellas to PIE and to Tampa Airport was, was my, one of my tops. Um, US 19 from Curlew to Pasco and beyond. Things have been going on for 30 years, I'm sick of it. We focus on east west and not north south and, and that's what affects us. And again, when we go to a regional situation, nobody's gonna care really about US 19. Um, those were the two big things that I thought, and I know it said list three. I essentially put increased frequency on our transit, which is not really the long-range transportation plans um, thing, but that's what I put. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and so you all know that we, this is a very similar exercise to what we're doing with the public right now. Uh, we're going out, if some of you were here five years ago, you may remember what we call the ball game. Um, we have six canisters, each representing the mode of transportation that aligns with what's on your sheet. And we give each member that comes up to our table, table four balls, and each one represents a quarter. And we ask them how they would like us to spend their $1 in transportation. Um, this is also something that we're doing online. AdvantagePinellas2050.org is our outreach website. It was just updated, so we're about to do a push to get this phase two of our outreach out there, and a similar exercise is posted there as well. Um, so would, do you have anything else for the long range? I would just really appreciate it if you all would help us by getting the AdvantagePinellas2050.org website pushed out. If you have constituents and people who are complaining to you about transportation or lack thereof or needs or maybe we're doing something they don't like, point them to the website because we need to hear from them. So please use, use your voice to help amplify that website. And Tina will be sure to send everybody after this meeting a link to that so that we can help you uh, push that out on social media or any other forum you're comfortable with. Commissioner Knapp. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, just a couple comments. I won't get into the rankings. Um, one thing that Commissioner Eggers mentioned that kind of jogged a memory for me about the mention of pilot programs, uh, this is probably going back 20, 25 years ago when I was a preteen. They had done a small little rail demonstration essentially between Oldsmar and over into West Chase. And it was just simply ride back and forth. And, and I remember as a kid, super excited, like, oh, this is coming. We're going to be able to ride around on the train everywhere. And then, as we all know, that never really amounted to much. So starting small and, and figuring out little projects that can say, well, 
here, here's what's going to drive some enthusiasm towards pushing and finding the big dollars that we're going to need to make these things happen. And then the one other thing I wanted to mention was I'm really happy that you brought up urban air mobility. I've been following that burgeoning industry now since about 2018, and I think it's really going to dramatically change across our state in the not-too-distant future. One of the companies, Lilium, is now establishing a, their first kind of hub in Orlando, and, and they've got big plans. And I know all these companies are out there really competing for that space, and it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out over the next few years. Uh, but that's definitely, I think, going to be something that really starts to, unfortunately, probably crowd our skies further. Um, but I, I really see that as something that's going to change as really an evolutionary step in transit. So thank you. Commissioner Agros. Yeah, I, I'm not going to get into mine either, but I, I would I, I like the, the concept of starting small. Uh, I think that's well said in a different way than I was trying to say earlier. But uh, I think Major, uh, Mayor Bujalski mentioned, I think we need to pull technology out as, a, as an option, as these are, these are options for transit. Because I think if we're going to go anywhere with anything, technology is going to be at the center of all of it. And I think local, I mean, I think cars and I think um, local transit, uh, I, have, I have cars first, local transit last, surprise, surprise. However, I do think they're interconnected and they can, with technology accessing uh, transit, accessing um, uh, shared automobiles, that <clears throat> there are a lot of options there that you can work. But I think tra uh, technology, if, we're not, if, if we think technology has done amazing things in the last 20 years, the next 50 years are just going to blow our mind. And, um, you know, so if it's airborne transportation, good grief, I can't imagine that getting distracted <laughs> drivers in the air. But anyway, um, so it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. But anyway, just some comments, not, not specifics. Thank you. I want to remind everybody that we want to collect your papers so, um, so that we can look at them and refer to them. Again, uh, it's just for internal use, but please make sure you turn those in. Um, collect them at the break. Yeah. All right, um, we're going to transition to the budget discussion now. And All right, I'm gonna, but before we yeah. do, I think Commissioner Driscoll, did you have something that oh, you yeah, wanted to add? Oh, yeah, I don't want to cut anybody off too quick. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. Um, just real quick, one of the ways that you can help us help you with the Advantage Pinellas with getting the word out is if you can send us... Um, a link. Not everyone sees everything that you post on social media to share it, but you can send us a link so that then we can go straight to it and share it. Others might want to come up with their original content, a graphic um, that's in a JPEG that's easy to post to Facebook or Instagram, whatever, um, could be really helpful. So any kind of an email that could be... Uh, you're not Chelsea anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, oh, I'm not. That could be like any email that has like those social media tools that we can grab what works best for us. Because most okay. of us, like we have time to sh share something to our page and that's about it. But I don't have time to be keeping an eye out for when you post it. Right. So right. anything like that could be really helpful um, as we try to help you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Dana, take note. All right, Rodney, ready? Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, good afternoon. Uh, Rodney Chapman, uh, Division Manager here at Fort Pinellas, and i um, excited to uh, talk to you about the most exciting part of the work session, which is uh, budgets and uh, the projects we hope to take on in the coming fiscal year. <laughs> well, uh, I guess for better or for worse, I've had the privilege of managing our budget process over the last seven years, and uh, each year is a bit of a different challenge, and I'll share some of the challenges that we'll be facing here in subsequent slides. But before I jump into that, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone um, sort of how our structural arrangement is between the PPC and the MPO. As most of you know, uh, coming out of the 2015 merger, there was a lot of focus given to how we uh, integrate the agency, both from a operational perspective, but also for, uh, from a funding uh, and budgets perspective, um, because both agencies are still uh, separate legal entities. We just operate under that fictitious name of Fort Pinellas. 
Uh, so for the planning council, uh, the primary revenue source is uh, property taxes. It's been that way since the PPC was established uh, many, many years ago. Uh, but the wrinkle is that all of our staff, whether they do PPC work or MPO work or a combination of both, they are legally all PPC employees. And we have a staff service agreement with the MPO to cover those tasks. Uh, the planning council pays everyone's salary, uh, fringe benefits, and uh, then invoices the MPO. And there's a regular rhythm that we've uh, established here for the last seven years to make that a pretty seamless process. Uh, however, there are some limitations of what the MPO can um, pay for since they are funded by state and federal grants. And so there is a cost sharing that occurs between the PPC and the MPO. Uh, to be able to recognize some of those uh, spending limitations that the MPO operates under. Another thing to note is that the Planning Council provides uh, what we call float for the MPO. And the reason that's critically important is because the MPO is funded by reimbursable grants, meaning that the money, or excuse me, your costs, you have to spend the money first and then seek reimbursement from uh, the Florida Department of Transportation. And then lastly, each legal entity uh, is audited, and audited annually, and uh, we've had uh, a series of clean audits here going back a number of years. So uh, looking at the agency's revenues in total, you'll see the, uh, there in these two pie charts. Uh, the pie chart to the left gives you a snapshot of what the planning council revenues are generally each year. Uh, there's property taxes. Uh, that are received. Uh, the Planning Council also receives revenue from the MPO. Uh, again, it's for those costs that I just mentioned in terms of staff salaries, any of the shared costs that the PPC fronts. Uh, for the MPO, we also do provide uh, local assistance to some of our cities, meaning we uh, are, um, for example, in the process of updating some of the local government conference plans, and so we sometimes charged for that service, and those revenues are budgeted there on the local assistance line item. We have a small interest bearing account, and then uh, lastly, we have a carryover. Uh, that is what we call the beginning fund balance, and I'll speak a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. On the MPO side, uh, there are four uh, grants that the MPO uses to fund its operations. Uh, it's a planning grant, a service transportation grant. There is a transit grant, and then there's a small amount of money that uh, the MPO receives to do transportation disadvantaged planning. So in total, that is sort of the revenue picture for the, the entire agency. Yes? I'll get to that. Good question, but okay. it's coming up on a, uh, on a future slide. Um, so isolating the planning council revenues, I wanted to give the board some insights of where uh, the money comes from in a little bit more detail. And these figures are based on the FY24, the existing adopted budget. Again, uh, property tax revenues are the largest revenue source. It's the most flexible and allows for us to do a lot of uh, the special work that we do. Again, as I mentioned before, the MPO uh, reimburses the Planning Council on a quarterly basis for those personnel costs and other expenses that the Planning Council pays for. And then we have that carryover or beginning fund balance. And you can see from the pie chart, property tax revenues are, revenues are about $2.3 million. The MPO charges about 1.4. Uh, our carryover is about 1.8. Small amount for local assistance and then interest. So where the money goes is a bit of a um, complicated uh, picture, and I'm going to try to separate the, the expenses out in two buckets. And so you can see uh, in this pie chart where um, a small percentage of our uh, expenses lie, and it's sort of in this small band here. Uh, it's 13 of our 20 line items, and they cover things like um, operating uh, supplies, uh, paying for our audit. We have a small amount of money we budget for travel. We uh, lease things like copiers and, and such. Uh, our, our rent uh, that we pay to the county is also within uh, this small band of, uh, of dollars. Uh, again, it makes up about 7 or 8% of 
total agency costs. Um, these seven line items that you see here, which take up the vast majority of that pie chart, are where the bulk of our expenses, expenses lie. And I'll kind of go around clockwise to, to walk you through those. Uh, so first, uh, starting up in the, the red area, that is uh, our rainy day fund or contingency. What that means is that um, if we have a natural disaster or can't operate for a uh, prolonged period of time, we do have an amount of money that we set aside, which in this case is $600,000, that rolls over every year to cover sort of those rainy day situations. Uh, we came up with this $600,000 $600, figure a few years ago. We requested the millage increase because our burn rate or the amount of money we spend every month is about $200,000. So that, gave, that gives us about three months of operating in case of an emergency. Uh, moving uh, over to the right, uh, the three uh, sort of dark gray bars are our cost allocation charges. Uh, those of you that have been around will remember that I speak about these most every year. Um, but for those of you that are new to the discussion, these are costs that we pay to the county for services they provide. These cost allocation co uh, charges cover things like HR, legal, IT, and so on. Um, the good news this year is that um, the costs are sort of stabilizing. Some of you may remember when I've come to you in the past, there had been an escalation uh, over a number of years in these charges. But um, happy to report that they've sort of stabilized over the last year or so, so we feel uh, that these are, are solid numbers. Uh, going further to the right, you see our salaries and wages are about $1.8 million. Uh, and then the benefits uh, further to the right. And then lastly in purple is the professional services uh, line item. Again, uh, these seven line items make up about 93% of the uh, planning council budget. We'll talk a little bit more about professional services because uh, this is um, where our horsepower is, I, I believe. Um, this is the line item where we're able to take on special projects or strategic initiatives that often um, are in support of a high priority need and involve uh, supplemental funding from our local governments or FDOT. Uh, the reality is uh, it's not a static amount. Uh, the, the amount does fluctuate from year to year, and it all depends on aligning the need with a partner and resources. And so for fiscal year 25, uh, we have one such project, and that will be the update of the multimodal impact fee ordinance. Um, excuse me, the uh, graphics below are meant to just note some of the projects or initiatives that we fund uh, through professional services. Uh, earlier today, there was some discussion about Advantage Alt-19 and our work that, we, that the board just adopted. Uh, last month uh, for that very important uh, redevelopment corridor in the county. We also were able to fund the Target Employment Industrial Land Study update through professional services. We also uh, funded our Urban Design Services pilot program as well as our Safe Streets, uh, Pinellas Action Plan, and our, our Active Transportation Plan. As Rodney, well. if I could just interject here. Um, it, it, I think it's worth pointing out that um, for the Target Employment Industrial Land Study as an example, we paid for that wholly within our own revenue stream. We didn't go to the local governments and ask them for funding. We didn't go to the DOT and ask for funding because that was a, um, a policy change that affected all 25 local governments that everybody's paying into through property tax. Compare that with the Gateway Master Plan, which is a geographic area of the county where we went to the local governments and asked for $100,000 each, the four local governments that were covered, and then I had already gotten a commitment from the Florida Department of Transportation to match whatever amount we came up with, and we came up with 500,000, they matched the 500,000, plus they threw on top of that an intermodal center study. So we effectively leveraged a little bit of money sprinkled by the local governments into a 1.3 or so million dollar effort which was substantial. Um, the Target Employment Industrial Land Study was what, 300,000 Four. approximately, four, 400,000? So there's an order of magnitude uh, of some of these things. Um, and in some cases, it makes sense to go kind of hat in hand and make sure we've got a coalition of funding partners. 
We're doing with the impact fee study. We've got commitments from Clearwater, Largo, and St. Pete and the county. Um, but we didn't feel it was important necessarily to go down below those levels for that one. Um, and that's kind of a trade-off we, we have. If we want to do more, we can do more, but we need more local support. There's probably only a handful of things we can do with just our own resources. Thanks. Um, so as I mentioned before, we are a dependent special district of the Board of County Commissioners, and part of our budget process involves close coordination with the county's Office of Management and Budget. Uh, they provide um, a lot of fiscal analysis, a lot of number crunching, as well as some overall budget guidance. And um, earlier I mentioned the fact that this process uh, seems to have a different challenge every year, and uh, the guidance this year is something that I hadn't seen before. So for this year, the guidance is that our FY25 budget submissions must uh, be prepared at the same funding level as uh, fiscal year 24. Uh, and uh, we have to absorb those um, inflationary impacts. For example, um, there is going to be a projected increase in the Florida retirement system payments that we have to make. There will most likely be some change or increase in the cost allocation charges that we pay to Pinellas County for services. And then uh, one thing that we're doing that is new for this year for our staff uh, because as I talked to you in the past about staff retention and recruitment, uh, we have been working on what is called a career path for our principal planners. And what that is is basically a step system within the principal planner job classification that allows our principal planners to meet certain benchmarks when it comes to uh, time in the position, uh, professional experience, uh, some professional development education, and so on. And if they meet those benchmarks, then there's an automatic uh, slight pay adjustment as well as a uh, new career, uh, sorry, new job title that they would receive. And so that career path framework that we are hoping to implement this year, uh, any costs associated with that to be able to retain our high performing staff will have to be absorbed within this flat, flat budget. Excuse me. They've also told us that. Um, the uh, flat budget does not reflect a 3% general salary increase or what is projected to be about a 10% increase in health care costs. So in addition to the flat budget, uh, they've asked uh, that uh, we uh, work to develop uh, stress tests, meaning we have to take 3% uh, and 5% um, reductions in our expenses in order to, uh, I guess, deliver uh, options to the Board of County Commissioners uh, in order to um, be prepared for further discussions with, uh, with that elected body. Uh, the interesting wrinkle about this is if any of these stress test budget scenarios are what is adopted, it will result in a millage rate decrease for the PPC. And the reason that's significant is because, um, as you may recall, a couple years ago when we requested the millage rate increase, we did it because we wanted to have a balanced budget where we didn't have to dip into reserves every year to balance the budget. And so we asked for a particular millage rate. And while we got most of it, we didn't get all of it. And so we ended up having to, again, use reserves last year, about $27,000 to balance the budget for fiscal year 24. So again, just putting this on your radar, we are very early on in the budget development process, but just wanted you to be aware this is the guidance that we're receiving uh, from OMB at, at the moment. Um, one of the things that we also do with OMB is to understand how our budgets impact the average taxpayer. And uh, what you're looking at here is 28 years of millage rates uh, and millage rate caps for the planning council, the line way at the top in orange is the cap for the planning council. And uh, you see that 0 0.166 mils. And the, the line at the bottom is the adopted millage rate for each of those 28 fiscal years. And you can see back in 96, it was 0 0.0214. And then uh, last year, or this existing uh, 
fiscal year we're at 0 0.0210. Uh, and in looking at the historical averages of the PPC's millage rate, it's operated any, or it's been anywhere between seven and a half and thirteen and a half percent of that millage rate cap. So again, uh, in our estimation, a very fiscally sound, fiscally conservative uh, agency that's operated very responsibly, and we will continue that moving forward. I also wanted to give the board a little bit more insight in um, to the millage rate that's levied by the Planning Council in the context of the other <laughs> special districts that show up on your tax bill. So uh, there's three such districts. Uh, they are called or classified as other districts on the property tax bill. Uh, in addition to the Planning Council, the Juvenile Welfare Board has a millage of 0 0.825, and the Southwest Florida Water Management District also has a millage rate of 0 0.2043. And if you looked at, look at those rates in context, you'll see that the PPC millage rate is a very, very small 2% of those similar districts. And then uh, lastly, we asked OMB to uh, give us some insights into what that means to the average single family homeowner, both now and looking forward in the fiscal year 25. Uh, I'll have a caveat on the fiscal year 25 number because uh, the property appraiser won't have the finalized uh, property tax valuation increases released until July. So uh, just for discussion purposes, we use 6%. Um, as, as a valuation, but essentially you'll see in fiscal year 24, the average single family home value in Pinellas County was about $221,000. Uh, at that millage rate, that homeowner paid about $4.65 to the planning, to fund the P, uh, PPC's uh, operations. If you look at fiscal year 25 with a 6% 6 increase in property tax values, you'll see that that incremental that rate does rise to $4.93, which uh, comparing fiscal year 24 to, to the hypothetical increase in 25, it'd be another 28 cents that the average single family homeowner would pay to fund the PPC's operation. So again, um, what I've had to do here is uh, give you a sense of the process moving forward. Uh, the process is, uh, in total, about 57 steps or milestones in um, a couple spreadsheets, but I've tried to condense them down into about five steps here. Um, it begins every year with the budget kickoff with OMB and guidance in January. We uh, submit a uh, staff outline to OMB in February. Our, as we mentioned earlier, our deadline to submit the outline is uh, next Friday. Um, we will then have discussions with the board uh, at multiple points between March and June to let you know how the budget's shaping up and get your input on a few things. And then we'll ask the board to make a recommendation on the millage rate and budget in July. That recommendation is then transmitted to the Board of County Commissioners and they consider uh, the PPC millage rate and budget and take action at two hearings in September. So any questions uh, on the PPC budget structure or guidance at this point? I don't have any questions. I just have comments. Is now the appropriate time? Go ahead. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to watch any county commission meetings recently, which I used to all the time. Um, I guess my question to my county commission representatives is I have a question are we do we are we making transportation a priority in Pinellas County and, and it can be on a personal level not on a, an entire board level I just want to know are we making transportation a priority here in Pinellas County when you mean transportation you talk about roadways anything no. whatever it is I no. you know I'm not asking you to be specific well, Roads, had, transit, not, not whatever. Only, not only is a bulk of the um, penny for Pinellas used for our roadways, uh -huh. but in addition to that, I, I, there were some nuances with it, but th there's two millages that have been added to absorb more 
roadway improvements. So, so to that end, um, we were somewhat behind, like most cities. Um, and so we've made a commitment to try to not only get caught up on sidewalks that are in disrepair, which I think we've just gotten caught up this past year, but also expanding our roadway for neighborhood improvements. So yeah, I think there's a, a, a pretty strong commitment, uh, at least I would say on par to what most cities do um, as I look around my own city. Commissioner Did, Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. In addition to that, in last year's budget, we was it spent 18 or $20 million on a, um, investing in an ATMS system as well. So, yeah. so I would say yes. Okay. I, and I just wanted to know how you feel about it um, because <clears throat> I get it. We want to be efficient and effective in everything we do all the time, whether we have a good economy or bad. I am an elected official. I know I know that drill. I have to answer to my own people. But what you just described to me was, I don't know. I just felt um, it. It really felt like we like what we're trying to do here is not a priority for this county. That's what it felt like to me. And you know, I get it. Three years ago, we talked about the fact that we can't hire enough people to do the job we're doing. And now we're looking at this, flat budget. We can't grow, I mean, people aren't even gonna wanna come work for us if they can't <clears throat> have a, whatever you described as, you know, future planning. In my city, I can tell you that we are, are the top three issues in my city, and it's been this way for the last five years, for both residents and businesses traffic, overdevelopment, and affordable housing. Now, overdevelopment and traffic go hand in hand. They believe there's overdevelopment because of all the traffic. The 15 extra million people that come here every year from tourism. In this organization, we have a real opportunity to help address that, not just in our county, but regionally. We just got talk, done talking about our long-term regional plan, but yet our tiny, tiny, tiny little mi millage is being asked to come forward with a flat budget, to not even be able to pay our employees appropriately. It's not even a flat budget, it's a reduction. I just, I think the exercise is, it's just my opinion, I, I think it just says a lot about where, where we fall in the priority and, and what, how much money this really is. It just seems ridiculous to me, and I don't mind saying it. I'm not trying to insult anybody. But my God, I mean, I've been coming here for what, 10, 12 years? I don't even know. And this is where we are. This is where we've come to. I know in my budget planning process, anything that we want to cut is because it's not a priority. Unless it's our, the economy is so bad, and we're not experiencing that. Well, I, I, I would um, respectfully disagree with a lot of your comments. I know. Um, because the economy is a big deal. The the, co the the economy is a big deal, and there are a lot of people feeling it. So, to to the to the extent that that's the attitude, then I think I think trying to curtail our expenses. The, the whole point of the exercise, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not really sure how it got down here, but um, is that we give direction up front so that the exercise is to try to curb government growth. If you look at it over the last five years, it's gone through the roof. Um, so it's, it's to start the process that way, create a list of things that are going to be sacrificed because of it, mm -hmm. and then we can make individual choices later. Not all departments are created equal in terms of maybe there'll be some things that come forward from MPO that that are really important that we don't feel need that should be cut because of the exercise that we're going through. And so what happens is if you get the other way, then we get to the end of the process and we find out that we're getting a uh, we're taking advantage of a 12 percent increase in costs or, or or taxes and we and we want to try to do something about taking some projects out 
and then it becomes too cumbersome. People say, well, which projects are you talking about? So this way we're trying to start with a little direction up front and then create a bubble on the side that says, this is what we're sacrificing by doing this. Are you okay with that? And I think it's a, I think it's a healthier approach to curb government growth. And, um, and I, I agree with and you. And I don't disagree. I, I, I agree with you that the part about salaries are a big deal, whether we're competing with Dunedin for, for talent or whether we're competing with the private sector for talent. We have to make sure we have the people here to do the job. So all of that's going to be, you know, and again, we're trying to do our little part to curb inflation, for crying out loud. So it's a balancing act, and I think this is a healthier way to do it than the other way. And I don't disagree with you at all, Dave. I do. I mean, I, I go through this myself. And again, I'm not trying to... It's just we've been going the last three years. This is what's happened. And we've never been able to catch up. And it... Again, I'm gone, so... I just... I want our county to be so much better when it comes to getting around here. And I just feel like it's just not getting there. Commissioner Driscoll. Thank you, and I appreciate the comments by Mayor Wojcicki and from Commissioner Eggers. Um, I think that the, um, the budget, whether it's a city or a county, um, should really reflect um, that government's values and the priorities. And so I can agree that um, it is a little bit puzzling that transportation isn't higher up. The projects that were mentioned as examples sound more like transportation infrastructure projects, um, repairs, things like that. Not real transportation solutions, but more maintenance than anything else. And we can see from the exercise that we just did, we wrote down ideas that we have to make it easier for everyone to get from point A to point B. And that is not going to be less challenging as we continue to grow. Um, I, it's also concerning that at, at a time when property values are going up and, and um, we are seeing, we're truly uh, blessed with um, better budgets and, and without, um, um, without an end in sight. I mean, as, as we grow, we're going to have more resources to do the best things for the people. And it's hard when you've got an, um, an entity like Forward Pinellas that is doing such great work, and we all seem to be leaning in today on this, on this workshop and on some of these um, ideas and the plans that are being brought forward. We really should look at putting our money where our mouth is. When it comes to salaries, so this would be, if this is flat, that would mean this is without anyone getting a raise, without being able to adjust salaries to be competitive, to hire the best and the brightest for Pinellas County. I would like to know if um, that request mirrors what the administration of Pinellas County is doing for itself. Does that mean that no one who works for the county, as the county is developing its budget, are salaries staying flat? Is it being done with absolutely no increases? Because if you're telling him he doesn't get a raise, you better not be getting one. I'm sorry, I don't mean to point. I'm, well, I, don't know I, like I, I don't mind you pointing. Okay, um, thanks. But, but to, to answer your question, um, we have a strategic planning meeting tomorrow where the discussion for upfront direction might be discussed as one of the items. And at least that's what my hope was, is that one of the things that we're going to talk about is that direction. I don't remember, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't remember the county commission ever giving OMB direction that says develop a program because we're anticipating no salary increases, no cost of living increases, no benefit increases in value because the, every year the value of your benefits goes down so you got to keep up with it a little bit. <clears throat> I don't remember giving that direction at all. So I, where OMB is doing this exercise, I'm not quite sure what direction it's coming from because we as a commission haven't said that. Um, part of that direction is to give some upfront direct, you know, some upfront guidance to the departments as they put their budgets together. 
but I don't remember ever saying, and again, I'm, I'm not ashamed of being fiscally conservative at all, but on the other hand, you know, reasonable increases to keep up with the cost of inflation, so to speak, are normal. So I just, I just I don't, wanna... But whatever, to, to the question specifically, yeah. whatever they're asking him to do, they're also asking every department to do. Yeah, yeah. I was so going to clarify. It's not being exclusive to right. MPO. Right. We're not being singled out in this exercise. And what I think what Rodney presented and can clarify if I if I say it wrong, but the salary adjustments and the health care cost increases are going to be dealt with separately, yeah. as a part of as outside of this flat budget submittal. So that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. But it, Thank you. And I would just like to to see that as this moves forward. Um, keep in mind that it is it is possible, and um, s some of, of you have have been a shining example of the fact that it is possible to be fiscally conservative, and find money for progress. So I look forward to seeing what all of that looks like as we move forward. Thank you. And I'd like to draw a little bit of a distinction between some of the discussion here. I think what I heard from Mayor Bajowski was about priorities and improving transportation overall, that's not gonna happen with our budget um, because we, we have such a small amount, it's to operate the planning activity. Um, you may have been referring to how do we get projects built and constructed and, and with federal and state money, there is always a local match. And we've struggled with local matches. Um, PSTA is at their millage cap. You know, we've got some of those issues. Yeah, but is also the good planning work that we do here. The long-term transportation plan being one of them is the visionary thing of where we're trying to go, even if we're not paying for it. Yeah. It takes time and money to create a plan like that. That's, that's true. It takes time and money. I mean, you're working with every city and doing these wonderful programs that never existed before, and you are working with FDOT to improve that, those roads I got one going on in my city. I know St. Pete's had several. I think Largo had one some, at some point. So <clears throat> you're a piece of that wheel, whether it's small or whatever. But you are, a, to me, you're a significant partner and will be a significant partner if we merge. So yeah. I'm just saying, here we are facing emerging, and then we're talking about everything flat. I just think that is unrealistic. Again, not everything is flat if you listen to what he said, okay? So there is no, the it. budget, the, the, the salary increases and, and benefits are being treated separately. So, and again, I think it's, I think there's, you know, creativity allowed in this process. And that's why I said you talk about some direction up front, but also create the bubble of what we may be missing out on by sticking to that budget process so just time I'd like Rodney to cover yeah. the rest of this I think we may have one more question hold on one minute please Sam thank you madam chair this is gonna be very quick I just wanted to ask you that ratio um, compared to the juvenile welfare board and Southwest Florida water management district I know it's not apples to ap apples but how commensurate is that based on like the number of employees each of the are like are we are we in the same ball game that's a good question i didn't dig any deeper than what i showed you but okay. i can look at that and, I'll, and I'll bring it back to no worries to you i didn't want to put you on the spot and the other one was just for consideration but in the interest of and and it's been again it's been um, 10 years since i was on ppc maybe a little bit longer but uh, maybe in the interest of the rotations maybe have we ever considered a two year as opposed to a three uh, just to speed up the t amount of time before cities get get personal direct representation on the boards. And that's all I've got. It can, that can be answered later. Yeah, it used to be two, um, so we've switched it to three just because we felt like people were getting up to speed and then turned out, and then we had a whole bunch of getting up to speed. Yep. I'll move rather quickly, and this, uh, and this is a time. Um, but the uh, MPO budget process is, is very different. It's embodied in the Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP. You'll get more information on this in subsequent uh, meetings. But it's a two-year budget document. It's federally required. It has all the detail about the work the MPO will undertake over that two-year period. And we do amend it or modify it, mod modify it um, from time to time. 
Um, Commissioner Eggers asked a question about the relative uh, amounts in those uh, federal, state and federal grants, and you'll see that uh, the total grant picture for the UPWP is about $2.5 million each year. And you'll see it's uh, in those uh, four uh, categories. Um, and it's pretty static. Uh, so unlike the PPC revenues that kind of rise and fall with property values, the MPO revenues are static based on the state and, and federal grant uh, formulas. Um, for uh, this next two-year period, here are some of the things that we would like to undertake uh, because it looks like we'll have about $440,000 in fiscal year 25 and another 210000 in fiscal year 26. And I was encouraged to hear some of the discussion earlier today about the importance of safety, uh, bicycle pedestrian uh, efforts and infrastructure. And so um, again, uh, these are just are some of the plans, studies, or initiatives that we uh, plan to take on um, for the next couple of years. Uh, again, uh, this you'll see this again. There'll be a board transmittal to uh, FDOT, Federal Highway, and FTA in March. Uh, we will have the, the final UPWP uh, adopted by the board in May, and then it'll be effective in uh, July. And just lastly, uh, we have a lot of discussion about staff, uh, recruitment, and retention, and I'm very happy to hear that because uh, it has been a significant challenge for us. Um, you may recall that um, we just lost Christina Mendoza, who went to work for uh, FTA in, in the Boston area. We um, lost Nasheen about a year ago, and you may see that she's back on this slide. So I'm um, kind of happy to report that we were able to, um, with Christina's departure, sort of go and have a conversation with Nasheen. And so after, um, a few meetings and it's kind of getting things in line. We were able to find a way to bring her back. So she will be um, assuming Christina Mendoza's responsibilities. Her first day was uh, this Monday. And so she represented us at uh, PSTA's uh, core uh, design retreat and is jumped right in into all things uh, PSTA transit planning. So um, her role will, let me step. Before I go into that, um, this is our org chart just to give you a sense of where the responsibilities lie with Nasheen and then Jared, because one of the things that Mayor Bajowski talked uh, about in past uh, discussions was the fact that grants and partnerships should be more of a focus for us. And so we found a way to sort of fold that grants and partnerships role and spread it between Jared and Nasheen. And you see it here in this yellow box here. So uh, they too will be responsible for not only managing our special projects, but also uh, strengthening our partnerships and finding ways that we can draw down uh, more federal, or excuse me, more grant opportunities. So those duties uh, that you see to the left on the special projects are all some of the things that Nasheen will be responsible for uh, relative to uh, Christina's uh, responsibilities uh, given her departure. And then on the right, just some detail on what we think the grants and partnerships duties will be in terms of having um, measurable benchmarks, uh, kind of relationship building and um, strengthening. And we'll have periodic reports that she'll provide to both WIT and to the board. And kind of underpinning all of that is uh, sort of visibility on a lot of our coordination meetings. We feel like those have been very productive uh, internal dialogues, and that's where a lot of the uh, idea generation and um, trust is built. And so again, uh, yeah, recruitment and retention can to be a challenge and we're just happy that we were able to uh, feel that very critical need with uh, a prior employee who's coming back to us from the private sector, believe it or not. So uh, with that. I'll just questions? wrap up real quick, see if anybody has any questions for Rodney. I just wanted you all to know, many of you are new, how we're funded, how we do things, we try to be efficient and lean, we try to deliver projects that the local governments need and want. And if they come to us and they ask for things, then we try to figure out how to make it happen. Um, and 
you know, I think we're open to any feedback and guidance. Um, I do want to give you all a little bit of a break before we start the meeting at one. I think that's fair. <laughs> uh, but if there are any quick questions for Rodney or me, um, we'll be happy to try and answer them about the budget process. You're going to see more of this in the next month or two. All right. Oh, yes, um, Councilmember Muhammad. No question, but just want to thank you, Rodney. And you were right. That was the most exciting part of the day. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, I think we should end the workshop. All right. Done. We'll see you back at one.